Check your aviation English. CD 1. Track 1. This is a very simple picture of two aircraft, both heading in the same direction but very close to each other. One is carrying straight on from left to right. The second one is veering away to the left at an angle of maybe two zero degrees and is getting very close to the starboard side of the first one. Perhaps they were flying in formation and one's got a little too close, or maybe it's a near collision. The aircraft are both twin-engine. They look similar, although the lower of the two is smaller than the aircraft that is above. It's difficult to identify the airline. The first one looks like JAL, and the second one possibly DHL, but the numbers and letters are very indistinct, and the tail is obscured. The only thing that differentiates the two on markings is that the second one has a long stripe down the fuselage. It's a very simple picture of two aircraft flying close together against a background of fairly dense cloud. Track 2 In August last year, a British Airways 757 bound for Copenhagen was taking off on Heathrow's northern runway. At the same time, a Virgin Express 737 trying to land in thick cloud was directed into the path of the BA jet. The AAIB report says the aircraft avoided collision 2,400 feet over the London airport by just 800 feet. It blames poor communications between controllers in the Heathrow Tower and says there was a combined mistake. Disaster was averted when a training inspector overheard the arrivals controller announcing he had turned the Virgin aircraft into the path of the British Airways jet. Both aircraft were then instructed by the arrivals and departures controllers to alter course. The report concludes with recommendations that communications between controllers should be improved and that radar screens used to check aircraft conditions should be modified. Track 3 Camcat Control, good morning. Yankee Golf 3, Fowler 3, maintaining flight level 37010 DME to Alpha Tango India, squawking 2662. Yankee Golf 3, Fowler 3, Camcat Control, Roger, squawk, power 113. Fowler 133, Yankee Golf 3, Fowler 3. Yankee Golf 3, Fowler 3, incorrect readback. I say again, squawk, power 113. Squawking Fowler 113, Yankee Golf 3, Fowler 3. Readback correct. Camp Control, Delta Foxtrot 211, good morning. Flight level 350. Delta Foxtrot 211, good morning. Maintain 350, expect higher. Maintaining 350, Delta Foxtrot 211. Yankee Golf 3, Fowler 3, radar contact. Descend to flight level 310. Descending to flight level 310, Yankee Golf 353. Delta Foxtrot 211, turn right, heading 270 degrees due traffic. Right heading 270 degrees, Delta Foxtrot 211. Yankee Golf 3, Fowler 3. Traffic northeast, 7 miles, slightly below fast moving. Roger. Delta Foxtrot 211, I say again. Turn right, heading 270, due traffic. Delta Foxtrot 211, avoiding action. Immediately turn hard right, heading 270 degrees, due traffic. Break, break. Yankee Golf 3, Fowler 3. Cancel descent, turn right immediately, heading 0, 090 0 degrees. Camcat Control, Yankee Golf 3, Fowler 3. TCAS climb. Roger. Camcat Control, Yankee Golf 353, we are clear of traffic, level 360. We have some injuries. Yankee Golf 353, I'm sorry, what is your problem? We have medical problems, people on board are hurt. Request immediate descent. Roger. Understand you have medical problems. Descend to flight level 230. Contact Camcat Approach 12 Fower Decimal 885. Track 4. This is part of an air show routine involving two aircraft, two Boeing Stearman, I believe. They are two vintage biplanes, and they are crossing each other in formation at an angle of approximately 40 degrees, relatively close to each other. The aircraft in the foreground is slightly lower than the aircraft behind. Both aircraft are giving off display smoke trails, which are set up by putting oil into the exhaust. The aircraft are in display colours, and they have got sunburst-type aircraft markings on the top wing. Because they are performing this aerobatic manoeuvre and have the same colours and markings, I think they are part of a display team. The weather is looking quite nice. 
In the background, there is light cloud with blue patches, so it looks like quite a pleasant day. Track 5 There are a number of differences between VFR and IFR arrivals. The first surprise for the IFR pilot is that although they are instructed to contact tower, they probably won't be able to talk to the tower. We'll always try to talk to pilots, but sometimes it's just not possible. This is because there's often not even enough time for verbal responses from the VFR traffic in the pattern. So instead, we ask pilots to rock their wings as a response. Or if we instruct an aircraft to turn base, and that aircraft turns base, that's also sufficient acknowledgement for us. Because we're able to land multiple aircraft on the runway at the same time, the second surprise is that IFR pilots will see VFR aircraft turning final in front of them until they're about one and a half miles out. Usually the VFR in front will land long and the IFR will land short. IFR arrivals are given touchdown position on the runway marked with a green dot. Landing on this dot allows plenty of space for rollout and also gives good access to taxiways, which allows the pilot to vacate the runway quickly. The third thing to be aware of is that IFRs will probably be sequenced behind VFR traffic travelling at, say, 80 knots, and pilots need to bring the speed right down on final and really concentrate on flying their aircraft at these airspeeds, which many pilots might not be used to. Track 6 Benahov Tower, I can see a blue and white high wing east of Benahov. Please rock your wings. Thank you. Say type. Cessna 182RG Skylane Treefowl Papa. Roger, Skylane Treefowl Papa. Keep your gear up until west of Benajov. Follow the beach baron ahead. Benahov Tower to Red Extra 300. Reduce speed 100 knots. Turn left and get in line behind the Icarus. Follow the railway tracks west. White austere alpine west of Benahov. You've flown away from the railway tracks. Follow the track precisely, thank you. Blue Grum and a beam, the radio mast. Leave the railway track and position left downwind, runway 01. Monitor 124, decimal 575. They will identify you. Good day. Benahov Tower, I see what looks like a low wing approaching Benahov with a nose light on. Say your type and call sign. Tower is in Sukarta TB9, 546 Lima. Roger, 5-Power, 6 Lima. Do you see the Mooney at your 1 o'clock? A-Firm, 5-Power, 6 Lima. 5-Power, 6 Lima. Make a right turn in front of the Robin and stay behind the Mooney. Yellow biplane, rock your wings for me. That's a beautiful aircraft. Say type. Thank you. 1933 Boeing Stearman. Stearman, follow the Robin ahead. Benahov Tower, I can see a white twin engine west of Benahov doing S turns, say type. Seneca Tree 01 Mike Alpha. Seneca Tree 01 Mike Alpha, the stagger wing up ahead is going to be too slow for you. Make a right turn 180 degrees and return to Benahov City to hold. Wilco, Seneca Tree 01 Mike Alpha. We'll find you an aircraft that matches your speed. Benahov Tower to White Amphibian east of Benahov, possibly a Grumman. A firm tower, we are a Grumman Duck. Grumman Duck, follow the traffic ahead. Turn left, overhead Benahoff City and follow Highway 31 South for seaplane base. Track 7. This is a picture of a Gulf airliner, which looks like an Airbus in dispersal, waiting probably for some VIP passengers. The reason that I say that is the air stair door is open. There is a long red carpet going right to the foreground of the picture. There is a cleaner with a brush. It looks like a straw brush, making sure the carpet is as clean as possible before the arrival of the VIP. There is a man standing by the air stair doorway, waiting for the VIPs. The APU is attached to the aircraft. Obviously the air crew are in the cabin. The air conditioning is on, waiting for the VIP. And right in the foreground of the picture, on the right-hand side, there is a fan-type palm tree which is used for decoration in the Gulf. At the tail of the aircraft, it looks as if some baggage has just arrived, and halfway along the aircraft, by the engine, there is a group of people who are possibly departure officials, waiting to say goodbye to the VIP. So there is an air of expectation about it. 
It's almost certain to be the Gulf, because the visibility is poor, with high humidity and a fog-like background. Track 8 David Botang has claimed the recent closures at Namdi International Airport are unacceptable. I have Mr. Botang with me now. Mr. Botang, surely it is only right that airports are closed for VIP flights. No, it's not. The recent VIP closures at Namdi Azikiwe International Airport represented a great danger to public safety. They led to unnecessary congestion of the airspace and increased the danger of collision by holding aircraft. But why is there an increased danger of collision? Too many aircraft in the airspace at the same time stress the control tower staff and increase their chances of making grave human errors. It is also common knowledge that the maintenance of most domestic passenger aircraft is short of the international standards, and in a situation of poor visibility, the risk of crashing is much higher, especially in a mountainous area such as Abuja. So poor maintenance is also a factor? Not just maintenance. Air passengers always consist of all sorts of people, women, children, the aged, the infirm, being medically evacuated. Many of these people could become anxious or suffer from a shortage of needed oxygen and other forms of first aid. There's also the possibility of mid-air panic, especially as a result of rumors on board. But if VIPs are not given preferential treatment, won't they be reluctant to travel here and won't that affect our economy? The unnecessary and long holding of aircraft is not only dangerous. It is very expensive for aircraft operating costs and for company time, the time lost by the passengers in their business, etc. The most logical solution to delayed and cancelled flights is a result of VIP movements is for Nigeria to have its own special military airport for its Air Force and VIPs. Is this something that happens elsewhere? Yes, it happens in lots of countries. The Edward Royal Air Force Base near London, Andrew Air Force Base of Washington, D.C., and Le Bourget Airport in France. Even here in Nigeria, the Air Force Base in Kaduna has a separate airport which removes the burden of VIP flights from the main airport. Thank you very much, Mr. Botang. What do you listeners think? Have you ever been delayed at an airport waiting for a VIP? Track 9 Cargo Lux 233 leaves Midhurst heading 027 degrees and descend flight level 180. Heading 027 degrees, descend flight level 180. Cargo Lux 233. Cargo Lux 223, this is SX radar, possible delay. Expect to hold at Vaten at flight level 180. Roger, expect hold at Vaten, Cargo Lux 233. SX radar, Cargo Lux 233 request. Cargo Lux 233, Essex Radar, pass your message. Roger, London informed us no delay expected. Confirm we have to hold at Vaten, Cargo Lux 233. Cargo Lux 233, affirm. Due to VIP movement, we have Air Force One inbound to Stansted. Delays are expected to all inbound and departing aircraft. Understood, but our NOTAM says scheduled air carriers and cargo flights are accepted, Cargo Lux 233. Cargo Lux 233, say again. Our copy of the NOTAM says no delays to scheduled passengers and cargo flight adhering to schedule and following the Laurel Star. Ah, copied. Cargo Lux 233. We'll double check that for you. Cargo Lux 233, there was a short notice amendment to the NOTAM for security reasons. All inbound traffic subject to delay. Expect holding at Vaton and maintain flight level 180. Copy that and maintaining flight level 180. Um, Unfortunately, we did not get that information before leaving JFK and we are approaching minimum fuel as the winds did not work out as forecast crossing the pond. We will have to take our alternate, Gatwick, if we cannot get a clearance in the next one zero minutes. Cargo Lux 233. Cargo Lux 233, I'll keep you advised in the next one five miles. Report passing Arkham. Wilco, Cargo Lux 233. Passing Arkham, maintaining flight level 180, Cargo Lux 233. Cargo Lux 233. Air Force One is on ILS now. There'll be no more than a five-minute delay and you are number three in traffic. 
Reduce speed to 320 knots and we should be able to avoid a hold at Baden. Roger, thank you very much. Cargo Lux 233. Track 10. This is a picture of three commercial aircraft in a tight sequence on an instrument approach to an airport at sunset. The first aircraft looks to me like a 757, followed by a 737, followed by a 747. The leading aircraft is at the lowest of the three and has its gear deployed and its landing lights on, and so does the second aircraft. The third aircraft at the back is at the highest altitude and hasn't adopted the landing configuration yet. I think the aircraft are on final and the controller is using two segregated runways and radar because the separation is small and the aircraft are quite close together. I'd say they are about half a mile apart. It must be a very busy international airport. It's a nice sunlit situation. The sky is very clear. We've got a little bit of low cloud to the right, which is rather attractively lit by the setting sun. Track 11 Good morning. My name's Donut, and I'm giving this morning's tactical briefing at 0800 hours. The present situation is affected by some staffing issues at Rhine Control in Germany. Affected sectors are middle sector of Karlsruhe sector and Nattenheim base and middle, which are combined. The delays have dropped since we proposed some level caps and individual reroutings, but there is still some delay. We have overfly problems in Central Europe due to thunderstorms and rain. There is also bad weather causing disruptions, especially in Vienna, with the arrival regulated from 0700 to 1200, causing delays of up to one hour. Also in Spain, we have Madrid Airport regulated until 1200 due to Charlie Bravos, and delays there are up to 30 minutes. I guess this regulation will be extended if the weather doesn't get better. We have in Italy a regulation running for Pisa due to work in progress. This is from 0820 until 1020 and is giving around 30 to 35 minutes delay. For Istanbul we have an arrival regulation running until 2020 this evening. Nothing we can do there due to lack of parking space. In Cyprus the west-north sector will also be regulated between 10 o'clock and 13.30. We are coordinating and we are hoping that by 11 o'clock the rate will be increased by two aircraft per hour. Unfortunately, the Echo to Sierra airspace is also regulated, making any rerouting impossible for traffic going to or coming from Israel. Before I hand over to Meteorology, I ought to remind you that the Romanian Air Force is conducting training exercises over their airspace today. Track 12 a. Kilo Lima, Mike 234. Expect further clearance time 1920. Anticipate additional 230 minute delay at Malmo. Roger. 30 minute delay. Request reason for delay. Kilo Lima, Mike 234. Kilo Lima, Mike 234. We have a disabled aircraft on runway. Roger. Kilo Lima, Mike 234. Track 13. B. Gruber approach, Oscar Echo 5498. Oscar Echo 5998, Gruber, pass your message. King of Charlie Niter from Grolak, IFR flight level 140. Estimate Golf Yankee uniform to Niner, information Charlie GNH 1010. Oscar Echo 5998, remain outside controlled airspace due sector saturation, time to 2. Expect joining clearance at 47. Remain outside controlled airspace, Oscar Echo 5998. Track 14. C. Stanza Tower, Charlie Charlie 32, request pushback. Charlie Charlie 32, negative. There is a spillage on the ramp behind you. Hold position, anticipate 10 minute delay. Roger, 10 minute delay, Charlie Charlie 32. Track 15. D. Delta 4 Yankee, maintain hold north as published. Delay indefinite, snow removal in progress. Anticipate update at time 1130. Roger. Can we have lower speed due chop at this level? Delta 4 Yankee. Delta 4 Yankee, clear to Levico, hold as published. Clear to Levico, we'll go. And Delta 4 Yankee. Track 16. E. 9 Alpha 3, delaying action. 
Weather below landing minima at Kilchuna. Fly heading 275 degrees. Turning left heading 275 degrees. Do you have an estimate for an improvement in the weather, 9 Alpha Tree? Track 17. I'm looking at a picture of probably a medium-sized turboprop. It's from Switzerland because it has the Swiss national emblem on the tail. It's sitting toward the end of a runway and obviously has had either a gear problem, the gear has perhaps collapsed, or there was a gear problem in flight and the pilot did a wheels-up landing. There's a gentleman standing by the aircraft looking very thoughtfully towards the wing route. I suspect he is an engineer who has been sent initially to make an assessment of the damage. Obviously, there will have to be some work done to get the aircraft back onto its wheels and towed back to the hangar. Interestingly, the propeller blades don't look too bent. So whether the aircraft landed with the engines stopped or not, I don't know. If the engines were going, we'd expect bent propellers. The setting of the airport is fairly rural. There's a tree-lined horizon, quite nice weather, the man is in shirt sleeves, the sky looks blue, and I think the sun is out. Track 18 Today, a Tupolev 154 performed a gear-up touchdown during its landing here at Almaty Airport. It skidded on the runway, but fortunately was able to take off and land normally after a go-around. The passengers were very lucky to have landed without any injuries. I have Mr Oblovsky with me, a spokesperson for the airport, Mr. Oblovsky, I understand that the ground proximity warning system, which warns the crew to lower the undercarriage, was switched off. Is that correct? Yes, it's true. Because the approach is so low, just 100 metres over the mountains, the warning was going off all the time and was distracting the crew. And that led to the aircraft landing with gear up? No. The approach was faster than expected, and because the runway was occupied by another aircraft, a 757, the pilot decided to do a go-around. But when the Tupolev captain saw that the 757 was taking off, he changed his mind and decided to land. But with gear up? Surely even with the GBWS switched off, the crew would have gone through their checklist and realised the gear was not extended. They simply didn't have time because of the change of mind, and they only realised just before landing. The captain immediately ordered the go-around. The aircraft reacted slowly and hit the runway and then lifted off the ground. Was the aircraft damaged? The Tupolev has large landing gear carriages which shielded the landing gear, wing and flaps. The aircraft skidded on these but was able to take off and land normally after a go-around. So, this is clearly a case of pilot error? At this stage, it is too early to say and we need to examine all the evidence. Track 19. Colombo radar, Papa Hotel Gulf 3002 has right main gear unsafe indication. Request radar vectors for ILS runway 0 far and low pass confirm wheels are down. Papa Hotel Gulf 3002, turn left heading 120 degrees. Turn left heading 120 degrees, Papa Hotel Gulf 3002. Descend to altitude 3000 feet, QNH 1000. Continue descent to altitude 3000 feet on QNH 1000. Papa Hotel Golf 3002. Papa Hotel Golf 3002, turn left heading 065 degrees. Left heading 065 degrees, Papa Hotel Golf 3002. Papa Hotel Golf 3002, clear for ILS approach runway 0 FAR, report localizer established. Clear for ILS approach runway 0 FAR, Wilco, Papa Hotel Golf 3002. Localizer established zero far with one zero nautical miles to run. Confirm cloud base. Papa Hotel Golf 3002. Papa Hotel Golf 3002, cloud base 2000 feet. What are your intentions? We will level at 500 feet AGL and request a visual inspection from tower to confirm all wheels are down. Papa Hotel Golf 3002. Papa Hotel Golf 3002, Roger, continue approach. Contact tower 118 decimal 7. Roger, contact tower 118 decimal 7, Papa Hotel Golf 3002. Colombo Tower, Papa Hotel Golf 3002, localizer established, runway 0 far at distance 8 nautical miles. We'll call level at 500 feet for a low pass to confirm wheels down. Papa Hotel Golf 3002, Colombo Tower, Roger. Continue approach, wind 060 degrees, 10 knots. Continue approach, Papa Hotel Golf 3002. 
Colombo Tower maintaining 500 feet. Papa Hotel Golf 3002. Colombo Tower. Papa Hotel Golf 3002. All wheels appear down. What are your intentions? We are minimum fuel. Request climb to 1,500 feet for visual left-hand circuit and request immediate landing clearance for runway zero foul. Papa Hotel Golf 3002. Track 20. This is a picture of a British Airways VC-10. It looks like it's standing by, either waiting for a VIP to arrive or it's just dropped him or her off. It's stationary beside the taxiway and the engines are switched off. There is a red carpet and a dais which runs from the aircraft to the taxiway. The carpet is red, of course, and the dais is surrounded by gold chain and posts. There is nobody on the dais at all. All the activity is taking place by the aircraft itself. There are two air stair doors, one leading to a closed door, the front one, and the main passenger one. There are one or two people in uniform at the top of the stairs. There's a group of spectators, some in dark suits, some look as if they are ground crew. There's also some security, some soldiers who are armed, and there is a baggage container near the back of the aircraft and an air conditioning unit also towards the back. It's a beautiful clear day, not a cloud in the sky. There is some very dry grass coming off the taxiway either side of the carpet. There is a feeling of expectation surrounding the entire picture. Track 21 Two passenger airlines were just seconds from disaster in a near-miss incident near Krasnodar. A quick-thinking air traffic controller saved the lives of 302 people. It's not just pilots who are responsible for the safety of passengers. Teams of dispatch engineers have a huge responsibility. At this centre, each controller monitors up to 10 aircraft at a time. Yuri has been working as a controller for over 10 years. Yuri's quick thinking prevented two planes that were only 200 metres apart from crashing into one another. Yuri, can you talk us through what happened? Well, I could see that the two airplanes were too close together and both immediately responded to my instructions. Why were they so close? The Tupel F-154 and the Boeing 767 both departed during my shift, but the Tupel F had problems with its landing gear and they were unable to retract, so the airplane started to lose altitude. Meanwhile, the Boeing beneath it was climbing at full throttle over the aircraft. They were both travelling at high speed and were only 15 seconds away from colliding. I instructed the Boeing to turn right. The whole incident was over very quickly, but it seemed to last forever. Yuri has received a lot of media attention and many calls, but he simply gets on with his job. The risks are many, but with concentration and good teamwork, we are able to keep the sky safe. Usually we don't know the names of the people who keep us safe in the sky, but now this air traffic controller is no longer unknown, and he is getting all the praise he deserves. Track 22. Sayumbu Tower, Narua 236, downwind. Narua 236, roger. How is your gear now? The steep turn didn't shift the gear, so we're still indicating right main gear up. Narua 236. Narua 236, you are number one for runway 16 left. State intentions. We'd like to try a touch and go to see if that loosens the right gear. Request touch and go, runway 16 left, Narua 236. Narua 236, approve touch and go runway 16 left, report final. Wilco, and after touch and go, can you give a visual on the gear, Narua 236? Narua 236, AFM. Narua 236, final. Narua 236, clear touch and go runway 16 left, surface wind calm. Clear touch and go runway 16 left, Narua 236. Narua 236, your right main gear still appears up. We're declaring an emergency now and we'd like to land the aeroplane. Which is the best runway for abnormal gear landing? Narua 236. Narua 236. Roger, Mayday. Runway 16 left is the best runway for you. 
There is plenty of space either side of the runway should you need it. Roger. Request full services and a visual approach and landing runway 16 left. Narua 236. Fire and rescue services are on standby. Report left downwind runway 16 left. Wilco, uh, Narua 236. We'll be touching down left off center line and um, be advised we're, we're likely to veer to the right on the runway. Narua 236. Narua 236, Roger. Thank you for the information. Track 23. This is a military transport aircraft, a high wing twin turboprop aircraft on a runway. It looks like it's about to take off as both engines are running and the aircraft has its landing lights on, as it would do for takeoff. By the look of it, it's starting its takeoff roll. The runway has a slight dip in it heading down towards me, and in the foreground is a flock of white birds which look like storks of some sort. A lot of the birds are starting to take off, so they have obviously been frightened by the aircraft. This could pose a problem for the pilots. In the background is a wooded area. Track 24 David, we're standing by runway 01 here at Whitsand International Airport where your team is working with a new system. Can you tell us what we have here? Yeah, sure. This is a mobile bird detection radar system designed to cover the runway here where we are at the moment. We have a horizontal radar that's tracking bird movements four to six miles around the airport. And this is the vertical radar which covers the approach and departure corridors. This detects birds four miles out in the corridor and gives us risk levels on bird activity. And uh, what are you hoping to do? The goal is to track species that pose the greatest risk to aircraft, the medium, large and flock size category birds, and provide usable control data to the air traffic controllers so they can more effectively manage the risk. How reliable is this technology? Oh, very. We can pick up a small bird out to several miles and flocks out to eight, ten or even twelve miles. Let's go inside and have a look. So, show me what this is. These computers process the real-time data from the radars and the data for bird tracks. The screen here shows us the bird activity around the airport. And uh, each of these green dots on the screen is a bird? Yes. Basically, it's an air traffic control radar for birds. <laughs> is the system operational? It's used by the military, so it is already operational, but we're still testing it for use in civil aviation. And what's the timescale on this project? When do you think it'll be ready? We're aiming for launch in the next... 12... Track 25 Victor Tanker, 821, airborne, passing 800 feet. I think we hit birds. Victor 821, state intentions. Request priority landing, Victor 821. Victor 821, roger. Turn left, heading 230 degrees, report downwind. Left, heading 230 degrees, we'll go, Victor 821. Victor 821, downwind to land. Victor 821, roger. Have you got any damage? A firm, we have a cracked windscreen and I think we had an impact with the nose gear, Victor 821. Victor 821, roger. I tried recycling the gear, but we still have a red light. Request the tower fly past to confirm the status of the nose gear, Victor 821. Victor 821, cleared low pass runway 05, surface wind 070 degrees at 15 knots, not below 500 feet. Cleared low pass runway 05, not below 500 feet, Victor 821. Victor 821, we see what looks like a loose cable or hose on your nose gear and looks like remains of some bird stuck in the mechanism, but the nose wheel appears down. What are your intentions? Roger, we'll attempt another approach and landing, Victor 821. Victor 821, Roger, turn left heading 230 degrees and report again downwind. Left heading 230 degrees, Wilco, Victor 821. Victor 821, downwind, request continue the approach, but I believe we will have problems with the steering on landing. Victor 821, Roger, we will have emergency vehicles on standby. It could be that we swerve to the left on landing. I'm going to make a slow approach, but be aware that we could come off the runway to the left. 
Victor 821. Victor 821, Roger, you are number one to land. Emergency services are ready for your arrival. Report again on final. Track 26. I'm looking at a picture of a busy part of an airfield which deals with cargo. There are three 747s lined up. One is Japanese Airlines, the middle one is Cathay Pacific, and the third one, I'd guess, is Polar Air Cargo. I can't read that on the side, but we can see a tail which I think belongs to it with a P in a circle and Polar written above that, right on the tip of the tail. It's a very busy terminal area. The foreground is covered with cargo, most of it in containers or on pallets, and there are one or two vehicles which are presumably bringing ground crew to the site. Toward the background of the scene, we can see areas of the terminal building, or perhaps the maintenance facility, I don't know. Track 27 Hello, Air Freight, how can I help? Yes, hello, I need to send a shipment of goods, and uh, I need to know the best way to pack them. Okay. Well, it will depend on the nature of the goods, but generally, the most important thing is to put them in a container. Is that really necessary? Well, containers will protect your cargo from physical damage and from rain, and will also protect your cargo from thieves by making it more difficult to steal. We charge for containers at lower rates than uncontained cargo of the same weight, so it would be cheaper for you. Finally, containers will keep your cargo together and stop portions of it getting lost. Okay, that all sounds sensible. Uh, what do I need to do with regards to labeling? You need to label each piece in big, bold letters in two places with the name, address, and phone number of the shipper and consignee. That is, the person or company you are sending the goods to. And do I need to wrap the container? Many of our customers bind their shipments in containers with metal bands. Use three in each direction around the piece. Use numbered seals if possible. We can provide you with these if you'd like to use them. I've got some pretty unusual things I'd like to ship. Can you tell me what is and isn't permitted? You'll need to look at our rules for all the details, but to give you an idea, there are special procedures for articles of unusual size or length. Articles of extraordinary value, art objects, hazardous materials, perishables, very fragile items, live animals, and so on. I see. Well, actually, I do have some quite valuable art pieces. What kind of special procedures do I need to go through? If you'll just hold the line for one moment, I'll put you through to someone who'll be able to give you some more specialist advice. One moment, please. Okay. Thanks for your help. Track 28. Birmingham Ground, this is Sun Air Power Zero One. We have a little problem. Do you have contact with an aircraft engineer? We'd like him to look at our aircraft. Sun Air Power Zero One, what do you need him to look at? We have an intermittent refueling panel warning light, and we're not sure if it's open or closed. Sun Air Power Zero One. Roger. Sun Air Power Zero One, an engineer is on his way. Can you let me know the location of the panel? On the right side of the fuselage, behind the right wing, Sun Air Power Zero One. Power zero 01, you say the access panel is on the right wing behind the fuselage? Negative, on the right side of the fuselage behind the right wing. It's about head height. Sun Air Power 01. Tower, King Lines 153. King Lines 153, pass your message. Oh, Sun Air, if that fuel panel door is on the bottom of the fuselage. Sun Air Power 01, is it on the bottom of the fuselage? On the bottom on the right side, Sun Air Power 01. It's open. There's a small door hanging open on the bottom of the right side of the fuselage on the Sun Air A340, King Lines 153. Sun Air Power 01, that was from King Lines 153. She just taxied behind you. Roger, King Lines 153, thank you. Sun Air Power 01, Birmingham Ground, the engineer reports that he has closed the panel. Confirm the warning light is extinguished. A firm, many thanks. We are now ready to taxi to Taxiway Bravo Tree, Sun Air Power 01. Track 29. This is a picture of an airport fire service training exercise. There is a mock-up aircraft which is made to look like a DC-10. The starboard engine is engulfed in flames and there appear to be some flames over the right wing close to the main fuselage. The fire is producing quite a lot of black smoke which is dispersing towards the rear of the aircraft structure. 
There are two large six-wheel fire appliances attending to the situation, both on the right-hand side of the aircraft. Each of the appliances has various firemen around it and firefighters on top of the appliances. The appliance on the right-hand side is starting to spray water or foam onto the aircraft structure using the roof-mounted fire hoses. Both trucks have BAA firefighting service written on the side, which makes me think that the picture was taken in the United Kingdom. Track 30 We have a large fleet of appliances at our station at Bijarati International. First on the list are the high-volume pumping vehicles. These are capable of carrying an enormous amount of foam and then applying it under massive pressure and volume. They are equipped with a roof-mounted high-volume monitor or nozzle which can shoot fire extinguishing media a long way to reach the fire. Another piece of equipment is this nozzle, which has recently been introduced at Bijarati. This type of roof-mounted monitor has a device resembling a spike that can pierce the fuselage of an aircraft and deliver large amounts of water and foam inside the aircraft. This makes airport firefighting safer as firefighters do not need to set foot inside the aircraft to extinguish fires. Then we have these rapid intervention vehicles which are capable of arriving at the scene of an incident more quickly. We also use these smaller vehicles as command vehicles during rescue or firefighting operations. Our airport is category 10, meaning that we are able to handle the largest aircraft such as the A380. As part of the regulations for category 10 airports, we also keep an area ladder platform capable of reaching the upper deck of the A380. The fleet is also supported by smaller fire appliances similar to those used in domestic firefighting. They are mainly used to deal with incidents within the buildings around the airport, but also assist at aircraft incidents. Track 31. No, Matara, fast wing 6 forward. We are maintaining altitude 5,000 and we are cleared now to 2,500 feet on QNH 1010 millibars. We are starting our descent to Noma now, fast wing 64. Fast wing 6 Fower, Noma Tower, Roger. We understand you have a fire. Cleared visual approach, runway 07. I confirm the QNH is 1010 millibars. Report maintaining 1,500 feet. We have emergency services standing by. Is it a cabin fire? In our mid lab, fast wing 64. Fast wing 64. Confirm that the fire is in your middle laboratory. A firm. We deployed Halon, but we're going to continue the Mayday call. Fast wing 64. Roger. For your information, we will make a complete stop on the runway. We will evaluate the situation then. And if we're not going to evacuate on the runway, we will return to parking by ourselves and stop the aircraft there. Fast wing 64. Fast wing 64. That's copied. Confirm field in sight. A firm. Fast wing 64. Fast wing 64. Clear to land runway 07. Wind is 120 at 22 knots. Clear to land runway 07. Fast wing 64. Tower. Fast wing 64. Fast wing, six fire, pass your message. As it looks now, we are able to taxi to our parking position. We have a signal from the cabin that everything's okay now. Fast wing, six fire. Fast wing, six fire, roger. Proceed to the isolated parking position via Golf 1. The emergency services will follow. We'll call ground services for your arrival. Track 32. This picture is taken, I think, in the summer probably in Western Europe or the USA. It shows a Boeing aircraft with some stripes on it, following a Follow Me vehicle. The vehicle is checkered and also has warning lights on it so it can make its visibility or its presence known to aircrew. It's leading the aircraft along the line marking the taxiway, probably coming into park having just landed at the airport. I say that because we can't see any terminal buildings here. The background is very rural, although I can see some high-tension cables in the further distance, so I presume it's just leaving a runway. Also, if we look just behind it and under the right wing, we can see a board marking one of the aircraft holding points on the taxi and runway network. 
Track 33. Many pilots think a flight begins with takeoff and ends when the aircraft departs the runway after the landing roll. This is partly true, but a large number of problems can occur with aircraft on the ground, with the wind, for example, causing problems. Do you mean gusting winds? Winds, both steady and gusting, can cause problems. A common one is a pilot landing in a strong wind which is aligned with the runway. When he turns off to taxi, the aircraft is blown on to a wingtip, and the pilot blames a sudden gust of wind, even though the weather station reports no gusts. Are there any other situations that can cause problems on the ground? Ground obstructions cause just as many difficulties. The biggest hazard is night operations on dark ramps, but many accidents happen in daylight when pilots misjudge wingtip clearance or focus on one side and hit something on the other. Are there many injuries? Not many of the accidents result in injuries, but there is always the occasional one where some unfortunate person walks into a spinning propeller. Ouch! <laughs> so it's rare to hit a person. But what sort of thing gets hit the most? For buildings, it's mainly hangars, and as for vehicles, fuel trucks tend to get hit the most. What about incidents involving other aircraft? Well, they're not as common, but still significant. You get cases of colliding aircraft, and also aircraft waiting to proceed across a taxiway or runway, colliding with an aircraft that lands and exits the runway at the same spot. So the advice to remember is that you're flying from the moment the engine starts until the moment you shut the engine down. Absolutely. Track thirty-four. Alpha Lima Six Romeo, follow the green lights to Bay One One Seven. Remain this frequency. Follow the green lights to One One Six. Remain this frequency. Alpha Lima Six Romeo. Alpha Lima Six Romeo, say again. Tower Alpha Lima Six Romeo. Confirm we're parking at stand one one six. Alpha Lima six Romeo, your stand is one one seven. Say position. We're at one o six. Alpha Lima six Romeo. Confirm one zero six. We're right at one o six. Alpha Lima six Romeo. Alpha Lima six Romeo, your stand is a long way before that. We'll set another set of green lights for you, sir. Stand by, please. Alpha Lima six Romeo, can you see any green lights? A firm, Alpha Lima Six Romeo. Alpha Lima Six Romeo, just follow the green lights. The green lights will lead you all the way back to Bay One One Seven. Roger. After this, we'll follow the green lights back to One One Seven. Thanks, Alpha Lima Six Romeo. Alpha Lima Six Romeo,、uh, we got the marshaler in sight now. Alpha Lima Six Romeo. Okay.、Uh, anyway, the Bay One One Seven is now just to your right, sir.、Uh, and understand, you have the marshaler in sight now. Got it. We got him in sight. Alpha Lima Six Romeo. Okay. Thank you for your help. Uh, Tau Alpha Lima Six Romeo, we've come to a stop. I think we've hit something. Alpha Lima Six Romeo. You have cut across the grass and hit the drainage ditch.、Uh, Roger,、uh, we're stuck. Stand by, Alpha Lima Six Romeo. Track thirty-five. This picture shows a patient being removed from an ambulance to be put on board an aircraft for medical flight, or the patient has been removed from an aircraft and is being stretched into the ambulance. The patient is wrapped in a large red tube. I think the scene is in China. Because the writing on the ambulance looks like Chinese, there are a number of people attending to the situation. Four or five of them wearing white suits and headgear and full face breathing masks. There are other people watching who are dressed in plain clothes and what looks like a nurse wearing a uniform and gloves. Everyone is wearing masks like those used by the public to prevent the spread of contagious diseases, for example, flu. In the foreground is the right wing of a turboprop aircraft, possibly a Saab or a Dash, and to the left and to the rear of the picture, we can see the aft portion of a rear-mounted twin-engine jet aircraft, possibly an MD-80. Track thirty-six. As we know, any impairment to physical and mental health is a threat to safety. Fortunately, pilot incapacitation is quite rare. 
One study showed that in 15 to 20 million general aviation flights, six cases of pilot incapacitation were reported. However, in four of those cases, the pilot died at the controls. The lesson is that anyone can become incapacitated at any time. And quite often, it is non-flying friends or family that have to take over the aircraft. Therefore, it is essential that everyone on board knows what incapacitation is and how to deal with it. Let's begin by looking at the causes of incapacitation. It can happen gradually or suddenly, ranging from mild to very severe. The most common causes of sudden incapacitation are gastrointestinal problems such as stomach cramps, nausea, and vomiting. Pilots must be careful with food and drink, particularly in remote areas or where there are poor facilities. Two pilots flying together should never eat the same food and, if possible, shouldn't eat at the same time. Heart problems and fainting are the main causes of serious incapacitation. Complaints of tightening of the chest, which are often confused with indigestion, and weakness and palpitation should be taken very seriously. Sweating, repeated yawning, or shortness of breath should all trigger suspicion. Track 37 Control, Bravo Foxtrot 324, I need some help. Bravo Foxtrot 324, Kadranga Control, Roger, what can I do for you? The pilot's passed out, and I'm on my own up here. Bravo Foxtrot 324, Roger, are you a licensed pilot? PPL 8 hours. Not this aircraft. Roger, I'm getting help now from someone who's familiar with your aircraft. Are you flying the aircraft? The autopilot is on. Okay. How many persons on board? My brother, who is the pilot, and my uncle. Can you help me back to Kadranga? We'll need an ambulance on the ground. Kadranga is quite busy now, so we're going to bring you into Katkas Airport, which is close by, and they have an ambulance. No one is responding. I'm on my own up here. You're doing very well. How are you feeling? Okay, but the oily fumes are making me feel pretty nauseous. You could have carbon monoxide poisoning. Can you get fresh air into the cabin? I've got a window open. Outside vents are open. Good. We're going to start your approach to CatCast now. Can you disengage the autopilot? Uh, how do I do that? Okay, by pushing the button on the control wheel. Autopilot disengaged. Good. You have control. Nice and steady, turn right one power zero degrees. Track 38. This is an interesting picture of billowing black smoke, which fills almost half the picture. It's coming from what looks like a replica of an aircraft, which has obviously been covered in oil or petrol and deliberately set alight. There is a four wheeled fire truck spraying foam onto the fire itself. The fire engine is in the foreground squirting out the foam onto very fierce flames issuing from the ground and all around the aircraft, and very thick, dense smoke is rising up. It's obviously not an active aircraft because there are stands below the engines themselves, and it's used as a model for firefighter practice. There is not much else in the picture. There are trees to the left-hand side. There's a clear sky with a few fair-weather clouds around, but as I say, most of the sky is obscured by the big black cloud of smoke. Track 39 A The aircraft ingested a Canada Goose into number 3 engine. This uncontained failure caused parts to go into the number 4 engine. Flame and smoke could be seen coming from both engines. Both of the engines were destroyed. The aircraft was out of service for five days at a cost of over eight million dollars. B. As the aircraft broke through a cloud bank at 7,500 feet, it was struck by a flock of snow geese. The impact destroyed one engine, damaged several fan blades on another, and extensively damaged the airframe. Repairs cost six million dollars. C. The aircraft ingested a gull during climb-out. Tower observed flames from number two engine and advised the pilot who declared an emergency and returned to land without incident. The aircraft landed using single-engine landing procedures. The core and all the fan blades were damaged. 
The engine had to be rebuilt. D. The aircraft struck over 400 blackbirds just after takeoff. Almost every part of the plane was hit. Substantial damage was found on various parts of the aircraft. The number one engine had to be replaced and the runway was closed for an hour. Personnel were sent to disperse another large flock on the airfield. E. The crew think they hit a gull shortly after takeoff. The number three engine had a vibration with oil quantity fluctuation. When the oil quantity dropped to zero, the engine was shut down. Feathers were found in the engine after landing, and repairs cost $1.5 million. Track 40. Toledo Tower, Web Air 537. Web Air 537, pass your message. Stopped on echo at the intersection with Papa. Unable to proceed on echo due aircraft in opposite direction. Web Air 537. Web Air 537, taxi to stand Delta 2 via Hotel and Hotel 2. Unable to make the right turn onto Papa, we have a postline Fokker 50 nose to nose with us on Echo. Suggest one of us will need to push. Web Air 537. Postline 9 or 1 2, hold position. You missed the right turn onto Golf. We're sending a tug out to you now. Track 41. November 653 Delta. Cleared for takeoff, runway 21. Wind 270 degrees, 7 knots. November 653 Delta. November 653 Delta, stopping. November 653 Delta, roger stop, state intentions. November 653 Delta, there's a tail dragger about 1,000 feet ahead, crossing left to right. Request backtrack for another departure. Track 42. Pure Tower, Transair 6326, we hit the lamppost here with our left wing. Suspect damage. Transair 6326, roger. Request your intentions. Company advise we disembark our passengers here. Can you arrange a bus for us? Transair 6326. Transair 6326. Are you able to taxi to parking area 2 straight ahead, 200 meters? Transair 6326. Uh, negative. Due precautionary engine shutdown. Transair 6326. Roger. We will send a bus out to you now. Track 43. Well, we're looking here at an aircraft wreck. I think it might be in America. I say that because the letters and numbers on the side of the fuselage, November 888 Hotel Bravo, tell us that the aircraft is on the American register. It's difficult to say how many engines the aircraft had, because only the tail and the top half of the fuselage are visible. The rest is submerged in water. It's difficult to say what the water is. It could be an Everglade, or it could be a lake. It could possibly be a coastal area. It looks to me like it's in the southern or central part of America. The sky looks quite cloudy, stormy possibly. Where the sky meets the ground, we can see evidence of palm trees and quite dense vegetation. So it could be in a fairly hot, moist part of Central America, somewhere like Costa Rica or Nicaragua. The aircraft has clearly suffered quite a heavy blow, perhaps in landing, because it's actually split in the middle, right through the nationality markings. The back of the aircraft has been completely broken. Track 44 Good morning. Today we're going to talk about ditching. It's something that people can worry about, but nine out of ten pilots who attempt ditching in the ocean succeed, even when it involves coming down close to the shore. So, ladies and gentlemen, it still makes sense to carry at least basic flotation in every aircraft, not just those which travel over water or coastal areas. If you ever find yourself afloat in a river or even a pond, A device as simple as an inflatable life vest will greatly improve your odds of surviving. For longer distances, a raft is essential. Having search and rescue near improves survival odds. The best way to do this is to file and fly on an IFR flight plan. 
A radioed mayday call followed by loss of radar contact will usually result in you getting the immediate attention of the SAR. The next best SAR insurance is radar traffic advisories while operating VFR. So, how do you avoid going into the water in the first place? Well, the most obvious things to avoid are running out of gas and making sure the gas you have isn't fouled with water or other debris. At least a third of all ditchings are caused by fuel exhaustion, mismanagement or contamination. Mechanical failures are listed as the cause in nearly as many ditchings as fuel exhaustion, about 25%. Fuel icing can also be a factor. Apply carb heat immediately when you suspect icing. Time and time again, aircraft are taken out of the water with no apparent mechanical faults, strongly suggesting that carb ice has caused a fuel blockage. But if you have the choice between landing on the water or impacting trees, rocks or other rough surfaces, I'd say the water is more likely to be survivable. Track 45. What's the ditching procedure? Just run it from the checklist. Get the cabin crew to brief the passengers. Nairobi Centre, this is Oxhead 371. Confirm the distance to Mombasa. We have fuel problems. Seems the lines may be blocked. Oxhead 371, this is Nairobi Centre. TDM Mombasa is 200 degrees with 30 miles to run. We are not able... I think we are not able to reach the land. We are 4,000 feet and we may lose both engines. We may have to ditch. Oxhead 371. Oxhead 371, we are declaring a May Day and preparing to ditch. Can you send us helicopters or something like that? Oxhead 371, Nairobi Center. Uh, May Day acknowledged. Malindi Airport is closer in your 2 o'clock. Range 1 2 miles. Can you make it there? Unable. Unable to maintain altitude. There are two ships. I'm going to join them left side heading 180. Can you contact them please? Mayday, Oxair 371. Oxair 371. We have very limited coastal rescue facilities. Uh, one case back helicopter is at Melindi and just airborne to your location. Say again your intentions. Oxair 371, say again. I did not copy, say again your level. Complete the ditching drill. There is a boat left side. I'm going to go there. 1,100 feet preparing to ditch. Mayday 371. Mayday 371. Roger. The helicopter is five miles away and has you in sight. Malindi is right three o'clock at eight miles now. Will you make Malindi? Unable. Unable to reach the field. We have two boats on the left side. Big boats. We'll try to land near. Can you get a warning to them? Mayday 371. Mayday 371, Nairobi Centre, Wilco. Track 46. Here we have a scene, quite possibly in Africa, where a light single engine high wing aircraft has landed on a plane. The plane has fairly long grass, possibly a grass airstrip, but I cannot see the surface. I would say the area is quite remote, as there are no buildings or airport facilities in the area. The aircraft has the registration Sierra Yankee, and looks like it could seat around eight passengers. In the foreground, on the right side of the picture, only 50 metres or so from the aircraft, is a large mammal, an elephant, walking from right to left. In the distance there is a ridge of hills covered by scrub and sparse vegetation. The aerodrome itself is completely unsecured, which is why wild animals are able to roam freely around the area. This is clearly a hazard for flight safety. Track 47 Everything was normal during pre-flight. Mm -hmm. The ramp guys gave the first officer the hazmat during the walk around, and I noted a 20 kilo package of dry ice. Mm. During taxi, we had a delay waiting for the closeout but we finally got the clothes out and proceeded with departure for Jakarta about a quarter of an hour late. Oh, yeah? After an hour or so, we got an ACARS message to contact dispatch. So we did, and they said we had a dog loaded with the dry ice. Ah. We needed to have the dog moved to another compartment. So we diverted to... Oh, you diverted? 
Yeah, we contacted Brisbane Control, explained the situation and told them we needed to land. What about your weight? Exactly. We were about 32, 600 pounds, so we declared an emergency, but made a normal approach and landing, moved the dog to another compartment and flew on to Jakarta. What a pain. Was the live animal noted on the closeout? Yeah, it was. Maybe we were rushing because of the delay, I don't know, but no one mentioned any live animals, either during the walk around or pushback. <sighs> I think we should have more information about carrying live animals, something other than just live animal zero one on the closeout. Yeah, that would definitely help to avoid that kind of thing. I mean, you know, we have to know if we... Track 48. One. Tower, cargo star 322. Cargo star 322, pass your message. There's wildlife running around in front of our aircraft over here. Cargo star 322. Cargo star 322, do you want a truck out there? Someone ought to come and check it out. They're heading over towards the grass on the right-hand side. Cargo star 322. Cargo star 322, safe position. Inbound on taxiway Delta, just before the intersection with Golf. Cargo star 322. Cargo star 322, what is it, do you know? They look like rodents, maybe rats, but they might be something else. Cargo Star 322. Tokyo rats. A cool catering. Track 49. 2. Well, there, 725. Cleared immediate takeoff runway 14. Tower, this is World Air 725. Negative takeoff. We've got a turtle on the runway here in front of us. Well, there, 725. Roger. Hold position. Cancel takeoff clearance. We'll send someone out there to get it off, otherwise you'll be waiting all day. World Air 725, holding. Thank you. Track 50. 3. Silverwing 383, vacate right at Foxtrot. Contact ground on 122 decimal 950. Turning right at Foxtrot, 122 decimal 950, Silverwing 383. Top Swiss Fower 6, clear to land runway tree tree left, surface wind tree 50 degrees 15 knots. Clear to land runway tree tree left, Top Swiss Fower 6. Top Swiss Fower 6, there's an object on the runway going around. Top Swiss Fower 6, Roger, go around. Fower Silverwing 383, there is a dead deer on the runway about 3,000 feet down, right to center line. Roger, we'll have a vehicle come and remove it. CD2. Track 1. Well, we've got a picture here of an Airbus operated by Swiss doing a very unconventional landing. We can only speculate why that happened. It could be the result of wake turbulence, or it could have been an unstable approach. But basically, he or she is landing with the right wing very, very low, so that the whole of the aircraft has landed on the right main wheel. As we look at the picture, we don't know what the end result will be. All we can see is the runway. There's smoke coming from the right-hand main wheel, which has touched the ground, but the nose wheel is still in the air. Apart from the aircraft, we can see the runway and some taxiways and a large area of grass behind it. The pilot could abandon the landing, apply power and execute a missed approach, but we don't know what happened and perhaps the pilot was able to land. Either way, it does not look like a safe or a good landing. Track 2 OK, let's first think about when a controller should use visual separation. ATC need to consider the following points before separating departing aircraft by visual means. Aircraft performance, wake turbulence, closure rate, routes of flight and known weather conditions. If successive departure routes or aircraft performance prevent the pilot from maintaining adequate separation, then don't apply visual separation of aircraft. Now, we need to consider a number of other factors. It must be day, the air traffic controller must have both aircraft in sight and must be in radio contact with at least one of them. The flight crew of the trailing aircraft must have the lead aircraft in sight and be informed of the lead aircraft's position, its direction of flight and its crew's intentions. The pilots of the trailing aircraft must acknowledge sighting the lead aircraft and they will then be instructed to maintain visual separation. 
It's important for the pilots of the trailing aircraft to remember that the tower controller will not provide visual separation between aircraft when wake turbulence separation is required. In controlled airspace with ATC radar coverage, the controller must inform the pilot of converging aircraft and VFR traffic. In cruise, when IFR and VFR aircraft are sometimes separated by as little as 500 feet, pilots must use appropriate avoidance procedures. Of course, the problem with wake turbulence is that it is nearly always invisible, so pilots need to anticipate where it might be. Remember, the weather is going to affect wake turbulence. If it's still, then there's more chance of wake turbulence occurring. Finally, remember your role. As air traffic controllers, you need to issue caution, wake turbulence, warnings only. You are not responsible for anticipating the existence or effect of the condition. Track 3 We've got some heavy rain and thunderstorms. Can we go north, Gulf Hotel 1559er? Gulf Hotel 1559er, you can either go north or turn left and try and get south of it. My radar doesn't see as far as yours. Uh, I'd like to go north. The weather appears to be moving south, so that's a pretty much better option right now. Gulf Hotel 1559er. Gulf Hotel 1559er, Roger, what heading do you want? Tree 15 or tree 20 degrees should be sufficient to clear it. Golf Hotel 1559er. Golf Hotel 1559er, turn right heading tree 20 degrees. All traffic, runway 28 departure, wind shear alert. Runway 28 departure, microburst activity, 1 mile north of center line. 20 knots loss, range 5 miles. All traffic, Sigmet extreme weather warning. Severe precipitation, northwest of the field, moving eastbound, extending approximately five miles across. Golf Hotel 1559er. We have a thunderstorm right over the airport right now. I can take you somewhere to hold or give you delaying vectors while you wait it out. We have a windshear alert and microburst reports for runway 28. Why don't you just give us vectors around it? Golf Hotel 1559er. Gulf Hotel 1559er, Roger, expect to send in a couple of miles and maintain your current heading. This will be vectors to the ILS for runway 28. There really isn't much once you go through the current area. Depending on what the wind does, we may be able to bring you in on runway 19er. Roger, keep us informed and let us know what works for you. We are maintaining tree 20 degrees. Gulf Hotel 1559er. Gulf Hotel 1559er, expect some delay. Vectors for now, turn further right, heading 350 degrees. The thunderstorm should clear in the next 10 minutes or so, and we can bring you in behind it. Can you reduce speed to 200 knots? Roger, we'll slow down to 200 indicated, heading 350 degrees and standing by for descent. Gulf Hotel 1559er. Track 4. This is a picture from the rear of what looks like a JetBlue Airbus. It's on the ground being prepared for departure during winter operations in a snowy, mountainous area. There's snow on the ground, which looks as though it has been cleared from the taxiway. Clearly, while the aircraft was on the ground, meteorological conditions weren't ideal. It was possibly snowing, and because the wings and airframe were cold, this attracted the precipitation which has frozen. The wings are being sprayed with de-icing fluid in order to remove any ice deposits on the surfaces particularly on the lift surfaces. The wings are being sprayed by a truck with special roof-mounted spraying equipment. The wings will be coated with an anti-icing coating once the ice is melted. I guess the aircraft is at the designated de-icing facility at the airport. Track 5 the most severe icing encounter I've ever experienced happened once when I was doing mountain flying in a Dash 8200 model it was minus eight Celsius. This is the magic temperature. We started picking up supercooled large droplets at flight level 220. Within that first minute, we had accumulated so much ice, we had lost 15 knots. I could barely see out my left window at the boots and propeller. In my experience, if you lose your windshield in the dash, it shows the ice is getting behind the de-ice equipment. I had the ice system set at maximum, and I lost my windshield completely. 
The airframe was vibrating and shaking violently, and I knew we couldn't climb out of it in time. We requested lower, and when ATC cleared us, I dropped the props to 1,200 RPM, switched off the autopilot, and dove down at 4,000 feet per minute. We finally broke out of IMC at 11,000, and ATC wanted us to contact the airport in sight, but I told them we needed to fly for a bit and get lower to melt all the ice as I couldn't see out my window to land. So, before we move on, have any of you had an icing experience? Track 6 Mayday, 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 Varberg approach, Donia 28 Delta, altitude 8000, descending. Mayday 28 Delta, say again. Mayday, 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 7200, descending, cannot control the aircraft, Donia 28 Delta. 28 Delta, roger Mayday, we have emergency services standing by in the area, Varberg airport is about 5 miles northeast of you. 6,500. I'm just getting some control now. I'm indicating 80 knots. I'm trying to maintain airspeed. Mayday 28 Delta. 28 Delta, I show your ground speed as 160 knots. Maybe your pitot tube is frozen up. I'm in the clouds. Altitude 6,000. Heading 040 degrees. I have control again now, but had to dive because we lost all the airspeed with no warning. 28 Delta. 28 Delta, roger. 28 Delta, radar shows more showers to the northeast of you. I don't know what the temperature is, but you might pick up some more icing. United 883, overhead Talsi, passing altitude 5,000 feet in the descent. Temperature minus 2, minus 5 at 7,000. We do have some snow in the clouds. United 883, did you pick up any icing on the descent? A firm, United 883. United 883, roger. Descend and maintain altitude far 1,000 feet. Cleared ILS approach, runway 0 Fower. Thanks for the report. Cleared ILS approach, runway 0 Fower. United 883. Mayday 28 Delta. There is a report of icing conditions to the east of you at 5,000. State intentions. I'd like to proceed to Weber. I have got the boots and heat on, and it seems to be okay. Delta. Mayday 28 Delta, readability 2. You might have ice on your antenna. Track 7. We have a large commercial aircraft, a 747, in what appears to be the landing phase of flight on a pretty miserable dark evening. The main gear appears to be partially extended and it has its landing lights on. Speaking about the meteorological conditions, we have convective storms producing fork lightning, dense clouds which the pilot would have to avoid, and there are possibly updrafts and squalls to avoid, and crosswinds. The rudder, the yaw directional control, would need to be controlled automatically, or perhaps very carefully manually operated, to keep the aircraft in line with the runway prior to landing. Visibility may also be poor, so altogether the conditions look quite challenging for the flight crew. The aircraft is approaching from right to left over a body of water, perhaps a river, and there are hills on either side of the water. In the distance is what looks like a large city with a lot of high-rise buildings, possibly in North America. Track 8 What's it like to fly through a storm? Well, actually, flying into a storm is pretty nasty for the passengers and can be pretty scary for us. Flying in stormy conditions is always a challenge, but when you get active storm clouds at high altitudes, when there's uplift and moisture in the clouds, it's really tough. If you can't fly through them, do you fly around them? Yeah, wherever possible. Flying through storms does happen, but I think most pilots would agree that it is pretty unusual to take an aircraft straight into a storm cell. What do you do when you're faced with storms? If there's a line of storm clouds to fly through, you usually go for a gap in the line. We have a radar on board which senses water droplets so we can see storm activity up ahead and plan for it. When visibility is poor or you are flying at night, the radar is especially important. The problem is, the radar only senses water droplets. It can't see turbulence. So even if you fly around a storm, it could still be a bumpy ride. We know bad weather causes a lot of delays for airlines. Are storms particularly disruptive? 
Yeah, weather is usually in the top three reasons for delay. I once had to circumnavigate a large area of showers over the western Pacific, which was almost 300 nautical miles out of the way. Definitely the longest diversion I ever had to make. Track 9 Indian Tower, Charlie Delta, Power 13. Reporting wind shear at 800 feet. Airspeed loss 25 knots with significant port drift. Charlie Delta 413, Roger. Continue approach. Charlie Delta 413, negative. Going around. Track 10. What's the 2901? Uh, I think we've had a lightning strike on the port side. Buzzer 2901, Roger. According to Met, we didn't expect any thunderstorm activity. Do you have an update on the weather, Buzzer 2901? Buzzer 2901, stand by. Track 11. Ocean Fire 52, climb and maintain altitude 10,000 feet, an altimeter 29er decimal 89er, fly heading 270 degrees. Climb and maintain altitude 10,000 feet, altimeter 29er decimal 89er on heading 270, Ocean Fire 52. Ocean Fire 52, request higher or a new heading for immediate weather avoidance. Ocean Fire 52, stand by. Ocean Fowler 52, we must turn immediate right heading 350 degrees, encountering intense weather showing on that westerly heading. There feels like a lot of Charlie Bravo activity around here. Track 12. Citylink 682, severe turbulence at flight level 350, request lower. Citylink 682, descend flight level 330. Descending to flight level 330, Citylink 682. Citylink 682, how are your conditions now? Still moderate chop. We've experienced some severe jolts, no injuries. We've spoken with maintenance and we'd like to divert to Southampton to get the airframe checked, please. Citylink 682. Track 13. This image is of a United States aircraft in blue and white colours with a large American flag on the tail of the aircraft. It is stationary on the apron and it is obviously a government aircraft. A number of people are standing by the wheels of the aircraft, and there is an empty government vehicle that has the back open, that looks like it is either about to unload, or it has already unloaded some fairly secure or important baggage or freight into the aircraft itself. The reason I say that it is important is because in the foreground there are three prominent security guards, each with an Alsatian dog, two men and one woman. They are dressed in military uniform, shirt sleeves rolled up and peak caps. One of the men is wearing sunglasses. The dogs are on a short lead. Each of the leads is a metal chain, and they are walking from right to left. Interestingly, I can't see any other guards at all. The air stair door is open for the crew at the front of the aircraft. There is very little detail of the airfield. Track 14 Good morning. We've already looked at delays due to technical difficulties, but today we're going to focus on the weather. Bad weather causes far more delays than any other factor. Commercial aircraft have a lot of restrictions and rules about operating in the vicinity of bad weather. Aircraft can't take off unless the visibility at the destination airport is forecast to be at or above a certain distance, usually half a mile. Airlines take great care when bad weather is reported because they want to prevent passenger injury. Two-thirds of the turbulence-related accidents occur at or above 30,000 feet. In fact, 46% of all passenger injuries in flight are due to turbulence. This leaves airlines with little choice but to delay flights when bad weather turbulence approaches. Although people think of the winter as being connected with bad weather, it is usually spring and summer months which are the worst for bad weather delays. These months carry hot, humid air which produces dangerous thunderstorms, severe lightning and turbulence. In fact, thunderstorms can contain just about every nasty aspect in one package. The airport an aircraft is waiting to depart from might have perfect flying conditions. But if the destination airport or the route has bad weather, you may well have to delay the aircraft. During departure, you route the aircraft to a specific navigation point, the departure fix. 
If thunderstorms or other bad weather are lingering around this fixed location or elsewhere along the route of flight or even at the destination, then you have to prevent departures to the affected area. So what procedure do you use to do this? Well, there are a number of things. Track 15. Ready control. Foxtrot 6 tree Fowler Tango Golf. Flory 2-3, altitude 3,000. 500 feet, estimating Pret 3-2. Fox Red, Sid's Tree Farrow Tango Golf. Pan Pan, Pan Pan, Pan Pan, Drager Control, Fox Trot 6 Tree Farrow Tango Golf, Cirrus SR-22, loss of power, request immediate diversion to Franglerburg, 4 miles northeast of Flory, passing altitude 3,000 feet, descending, heading 310 degrees, 2 persons on board. Fox Trot 6 Tree Farrow Tango Golf, Drager Control, Roger Pan. Fienerberg is 9 miles to the east of your position. Turn right, heading 080 degrees. Right, heading 080 degrees. Foxtrot 6 Tree, Fowler Tango Golf. Foxtrot 6 Tree, Fowler Tango Golf, declaring an emergency. We've lost all engine power now. I say again, we have no engine power. Passing altitude 2600, descending. Heading 050 degrees. Budger Mayday, the emergency services have been alerted. Freenaburg is now 1 o'clock, 7 miles. Contact Freenaburg on 12 Faradecimal 050. 12 Faradecimal 050. Foxtrot 6 Tree Farad Tango Golf. Freenaburg Tower. Foxtrot 6 Tree Farad Tango Golf. We're 6 miles east of your field, altitude 2100. Descending. Heading 080. We have no power. Foxtrot Tango Golf, Queen Le Bourg Tower, Roger Mede, we are ready for your arrival. Altitude 1600, descending. What is the closest suitable terrain for a forced landing? Foxtrot Tango Golf. Foxtrot Tango Golf, you have unwooded fields, 1 o'clock, 4 miles. Queen Le Bourg is now 12 o'clock, 5 miles. Altitude 1400. I don't think we have enough height to make it over the water. We may put it down in the lake. Foxtrot Tango Golf. Fox Tango Golf, Roger. We are in contact with the sailing club on Lac de Frien. Frien Le Bourg is now 12 o'clock, 4 miles. Altitude 900, Fox Tango Golf. Fox Tango Golf, a right turn heading 100 degrees will take you closer to rescue vessels. Roger. 100 degrees, sailing club in sight. Preparing to ditch, Fox Tango Golf. Fox Tango Golf, Roger. We are advised there is no activity on the lake. Surface wind calm. Track 16. This is a picture of a 737 on the ground, obviously, and it has suffered a serious problem. The top half of the fuselage has blown away. It probably happened in the air. It looks more like a pressurization failure than a result of sabotage. The pilot seems to have got the aircraft on the ground safe and sound, and I'd imagine the passengers, other than those in the damaged area, were evacuated okay. We don't know anything about the weather conditions or geographical surroundings other than there are a few hills in the background. It looks very much as if it suffered a major structural failure and been safely landed. I guess it is now being investigated to see what recommendations can be made to the authorities and manufacturer. The unfortunate thing is that anybody sitting in that area would have probably suffered major injuries, if not fatalities. There is a vehicle in the foreground near the aircraft, just in front of the right engine. It has some sort of emblem on the side, but it is difficult to make out. The aircraft has two stripes running along the fuselage, which have been interrupted by the missing section. Track 17 Yesterday, a passenger flight en route to Kiev had to make an emergency landing in Stockholm when an oxygen cylinder smashed through the skin of an aircraft. The Boeing 747 jumbo jet was flying from Oslo to the Ukrainian capital with 384 passengers and 18 crew on board. It was cruising at 30,000 feet when the aircraft experienced a loss of cabin pressure. Passengers and crew report hearing a loud bang prior to the loss of pressure, which was probably the cylinder exploding. The aircraft was forced to make an emergency landing at Stockholm, where several of the passengers were treated for shock. 
an immediate inspection revealed a rupture in the fuselage measuring one and a half meters. Investigators haven't ruled out terrorist activity, although no traces of explosive residue were found. Officials have said the most likely cause is failure of one of the seven oxygen cylinders found on this craft. The pressure from the failed cylinder sent it through the passenger cabin and out of the fuselage, narrowly missing a number of passengers. In the past, external causes have resulted in blown cylinders. However, the faulty cylinder in this case hasn't been recovered yet. The exact cause of the explosion is unknown, and it is likely to stay that way until investigators are able to find the cylinder. Track 18. London information, Sunbird Fower Zero Fower. We're inbound for landing at Exeter. We've just um, trees miles southwest of the Bravo Hotel Delta Bar, descending out of 15,000 feet, and we have rocketed. We are on this ride, declaring an emergency. Sunbird Fower Zero Fower. The wind at Exeter is zero fower, zero degrees at one five knots. QNH is one zero two zero millibars and they're using runway zero eight. Your transmission is breaking up. Please say again your call sign. Is it fower zero fower? Is that correct? Or two fower zero five? Fower zero fower. Sunbird fower zero fower. London, we request straight in approach from 11,000 feet. Request clearance for a priority landing runway zero eight. Also request full emergency services. Okay, service is on their way. Squawk 7700, can you switch to frequency 128 decimal 97 faith? Sunbird, power zero, power negative. We would like to work this frequency. It looks like we've lost a door. We have a hole in this um, left side of the aircraft. Uh, we're going to need assistance. We cannot communicate with the flight attendants. Uh, we'll need assistance from the passengers when we land. Okay, I understand. We're going to have all emergency services. They are in place and ready for your arrival. Roger. Passing through 9 at 10 feet. Are we clear to land runway 08? Track 19. In the first picture, there is a man who is walking down the aisle of an aircraft cabin between the seats with an aggressive look on his face. He has black hair and is wearing a shirt. There are two other passengers in the picture. One man who is standing behind, and an older man in front, on the left side of the picture, who is sitting in his seat. There is a woman, too, who appears to be dressed in uniform. She is perhaps a flight attendant. All three people look concerned, as if they are afraid of the man, or as if he might do something malicious. In the second picture, the man has entered the cockpit, and has attacked the captain, who is seated at the controls. There is a struggle. The attacker has his right arm around the captain's neck and has the captain's head in a headlock. The captain is trying to stop the attacker strangling him, using his hands to pull away the attacker's arm. Behind the attacker is what looks like a member of the crew. He has his right arm around the attacker and is holding the attacker's left arm, trying to pull him away from the captain. In the final picture, things appear to be under control, Clearly, the male flight attendant wrestled the attacker to the floor and now the attacker is lying face down in the aisle of the cabin. The male flight attendant is restraining the attacker by kneeling across the attacker's back and pulling his right arm behind his back. There are two female flight attendants, one kneeling in the aisle behind the attacker and the other is stood behind her. I can also see a passenger in her seat on the right-hand side who looks a bit worried. Track 20. A Western Pacific flight makes an emergency landing in Seoul after a passenger declares that the aircraft is falling apart. News East Kate Shamayoto is at the airport with more details of this strange case. You just don't expect things like this to happen. All of a sudden, a passenger in the very last row starts yelling that the aircraft is going to break up. Flight 76 was on its way from Busan to Beijing when it was forced to make an emergency stop in Seoul after flight attendants couldn't get the man under control. The aircraft landed at around 6.30 last night. I understand the flight attendants had some special help on board. What can you tell us about that? 
apparently there was quite a struggle, and when the passengers saw that the attendants were struggling to control the man, they jumped in to help. They said they had some difficulty getting him onto the floor, but no one was hurt. The passengers helped to hold him down while his ankles and wrists were handcuffed. When the flight eventually landed, Korean police took the man away. So far, we've not heard what's going to happen to him. We spoke to the flight crew yesterday evening. This is what the flight's captain had to say. He had a drink at the Arjun Airport. He was on medication but didn't take it. Perhaps a combination of not taking the medication, the drink, and the altitude affected his usual behavior. We diverted because we felt he was a threat to the safety of the flight. Back to you in the newsroom. Track 21. Al Shakik approach. India Power 53. Good afternoon. India Power 53. Al Shakik approach. Good afternoon. I understand you are looking for a diversion and immediate arrival for Al Shakik. Yes, sir. That's correct. India Power 53. Plan a visual approach to join left base for runway 27. Wind 220 degrees at 9 knots. Visual for 27 left. India Power 53. India Power 53. Roger. Confirm status. He's unarmed now. The cockpit is secure. We've got about five people holding him down. He's struggling. In their power 53. In their power 53, you will be number one for the airport. Speed at your discretion. Say again, wind. In their power 53. Wind 220 degrees at 9 knots. I'm sorry. With that wind, we're too heavy. 27 left is not going to work. Request 22 left. In their power 53. In their power 53, Roger. Turn left heading 020 degrees. Vectors for a left downwind runway 22 left. Turn left heading 020 degrees. In there, power 53. In there, power 53, confirm intentions after touchdown. We'd like to go to a company gate if possible. We haven't coordinated with them yet. In there, power 53. In there, power 53, would you like me to coordinate with operations? A firm in there, power 53. In there, power 53, after landing, proceed to North Cargo 5. Is that okay with you? North Cargo 5, request progressive taxi after landing. In there, power 53. In there, power 53, we'll code that will be with ground on 120 decimal 1. Track 22. Okay, we've got two pictures here, both taken in the same place looking at a departure lounge, maybe a Dutch one, at gate F. There's a sign saying Vertrecht. Maybe that's Dutch, I don't know. The picture on the left has a machine which looks like it's used to examine suspicious packages. It's remote controlled. There's an operator behind the machine with a handheld remote control device. The machine looks like it could pick things up. It's got a kind of claw on the end of an arm. It's a tracked vehicle with a number of wheels. The right hand picture looks like it was taken at the same place but taken from a slightly different angle. In this picture, we see an individual in a protective suit who looks like he could be a bomb disposal expert. He's got a clipboard in his left hand and is wearing a helmet with the visor down. He's not wearing gloves, which is a bit strange. There doesn't seem to be anyone else around, so I presume the departure lounge has been evacuated. Maybe there was something suspicious in there, although there is no sign of anything. The gentleman is leaving the departure lounge. I think he's probably been looking at something in there rather than going out to find something else. Track 23 Latest news on the attempted hijacking of a Greek jet has led to conflicting reports from the airline and passengers. Yesterday we were told a middle-aged man attempted to hijack the jet and reroute it to Germany, threatening to blow it up if his demands weren't met. The man, who hasn't been named, demanded that the flight from the Greek resort of Corfu be taken to Munich in Germany. He was arrested after the aircraft reached its original destination of Kharkov. The would-be hijacker in his early 50s made the demand in a note to the pilot of the Airbus A320, which was carrying tourists returning from the Mediterranean resort. The offender got out of his seat and handed the note to a flight attendant, saying he had a bomb. The man then attempted to walk towards the cockpit. At this point, he was overpowered by several passengers. The prosecutor's spokeswoman did not name the man, but said he was from a Central Asian region. 
This contradicts the statement by a Greek official that said he was a German national. The man did not have explosives, and investigators are still seeking to determine whether he was drunk. However, some passengers are questioning official reports. They said they were on the flight, and they didn't notice anything unusual. They denied reports the man was drunk, and said they did not see anybody fighting with passengers or cabin crew. In fact, quite the opposite. The passengers reported the whole flight was calm, and they didn't notice anything unusual. It was only when they landed and saw armed police near the aircraft that they realized there was a problem. Some of the passengers had relatives waiting to meet them. They too saw the security personnel moving toward the aircraft, and the passengers began to get worried telephone calls on their mobile phones. An unconfirmed report has suggested that it was just an overreaction by a member of the cabin crew who was being harassed by the passenger. Track 24. Three five power. This is Sea Force Control. We have had a report of three suspicious passengers aboard your aircraft, who all boarded in the last minute and all have passport numbers in sequence. All are male. Roger. Do you have seat numbers? Three five power. They are seated together in row hotel seats two, three, and four. Sea Force Control. We have a problem. There are three armed passengers standing in the aisle. One is carrying what he says is a bomb. And they are demanding I open the cockpit door. Otherwise, it will blow up the aircraft. Fair Air Three Five Power. Roger Three Five Power. What are your intentions? I have briefed the purser and the security marshals that I intend to put the aircraft into negative G. This will not be expected, and it will cause the standing passengers to fall down. When this happens, the purser and security marshals are in a position to overpower them. Fair Air Three Five Power. Sea Force Control. Roger. Keep us informed. Wilco, three five power. Sea fourth control, the maneuver was successful. The three passengers are restrained, and the package is not a bomb. Request immediate diversion to Pembroke for a radar vectored straight in approach for an ILS approach runway three five. Fair air three five power. Track twenty five. Here we have a picture of an Airbus A three forty. Taken from the right side of the aircraft, I don't know if it's landing or taking off. I can see that it is just airborne, but the main gear wheels are just a couple of feet above the ground. It could be an early rotation or an over rotation, and it looks like it's about to scrape its tail on the runway. The tail is very close to the runway surface. Perhaps they are testing the aircraft because it's not in an airline colour. It has manufacturer's markings. It could also be a test because the attitude is very strange. It's a very high nose up attitude. It's hard to tell, but it doesn't seem that there are any flaps. So maybe they are doing a flapless takeoff, which might explain why it's not getting airborne. Track twenty six. The crew did a thorough pre-flight briefing for a reduced power takeoff on runway one six, and the first officer was to be the handling pilot for the departure. During the takeoff roll, the captain called for the first officer to rotate, but the aircraft was slow to respond with a nose-up pitch. The captain called again to rotate, and the first officer applied greater nose-up command. The nose of the aircraft then raised, and the tail made contact with the runway surface. The captain then selected toga or maximum takeoff thrust. The engines responded immediately, and the aircraft lifted off shortly afterwards. An inspection of the runway and the overrun areas identified multiple contact marks. The tail of the aircraft made contact with the runway at three locations. After leaving the stopway, two scrape marks were identified in the grassed area. During takeoff, the aircraft also made contact with ground infrastructure. It clipped a runway three four high intensity centerline strobe light, and the left main landing gear inboard rear tire hit the runway one six localizer antenna. The impact of which disabled the localizer function. Significant damage to the aircraft included abrasion to the rear lower fuselage and damage to the rear pressure bulkhead. The abrasion actually wore through the full thickness of the skin. The inspection panel for the wastewater drain point came off, and that panel was later found near the end of the runway. Track twenty-seven. One. 
Northwest Air 886, after the landing DC-9, line up. Line up after the landing DC-9, West Air 886. Tower Skybird Fower 51, there's quite a bit of fuel on the right side of my taxiway. Skybird Fower 51, roger, we'll send someone to clear that up. Azure 525, we could see a leak coming out of the top of the right wing of the West Air. Easy 775, it looked as if it was trailing a white vapor on the starboard side. West Air 886, do you copy this? Yes, we're looking at it right now. West Air 886. Track 28. 2. Flight style file 33, three, clear for takeoff runway 3 far. Surface wind 320 degrees, 10 zero knots. Clear for takeoff runway 3 far. Flight style file 33. Three. Stopping, flight style file 33. Three. Flight Star Fowl Tree Tree, Roger, do you have a problem? Flight Star Fowl Tree Tree, a firm, there's debris of the runway. We are unable to take off. Flight Star Fowl Tree Tree, what can you see? It looks like construction material, like stones all over the runway here. Flight Star Fowl Tree Tree. Roger, hold position. Taurus 823, go around. I say again, go around. Acknowledge. Going around, Taurus 823. Track 29. Three. Goose 506, cancel request to depart runway 25 right. Goose 506, roger. We'd like to return to the gate please, Goose 506. Goose 506, right turn on taxiway Bravo and hold short of Charlie 8, please. Right on Bravo and hold short of Charlie 8, Goose 506. Goose 506, can you contact your company and find out if you can go back to gate 48? They've parked an aircraft adjacent to where you were, and I'm not sure if there's wingtip clearance. We are contacting them now, Goose 506. Goose 506, say reason for aborted takeoff. We had an indication of smoke at door 5, Goose 506. Goose 506, roger. Track 30. This picture is obviously a maritime picture out on the ocean. Probably not very far out, because the sea is quite calm. The ship in the picture is very much maritime aviation related. I don't think it's a full aircraft carrier, and it might be one of the helicopter support vessels of the Navy. It looks quite modern, and is being attended to by several flotilla boats, again small boats, indicating it's near the shore. The aircraft flying past is a Nimrod, which does maritime reconnaissance and search and rescue, and also high-level reconnaissance for the military in remote areas. The aircraft is quite low, probably only about two or three hundred feet above the sea, and is in a left-hand turn. I would imagine this is a display fly-past. The whole picture could well be part of a display. As for the ship itself, I don't think it's moving as there is no bow wave. It seems to be at anchor. The wind is slight because there is a flag on the front that has got a slight wind. There is a fairly calm sea, and in the foreground it looks like there's a lifeboat crewed by people in life jackets. It's going quite fast towards the ship, and on the right-hand side there's a little dinghy. Track 31 We were en route from Brussels to Vitoria, and the flight engineer had just brought us coffee. Paris gave us a radar heading, and I placed my coffee on the footrest at the bottom of the instrument panel, then reached down to turn the heading bug on the CDI. As I did so, my hand caught the coffee and knocked the cup over. The coffee spread across the GPS, running between the buttons, and the screen started blinking. An error message appeared, then the screen went blank, Flicker briefly, and then went blank again. I switched the GPS off before it started smoking or popping circuit breakers. Paris inquired whether we were on the heading, and I turned the heading bug. Bob, the co-pilot, pulled out the high-altitude chart. On this, the VOR and reporting points were in print so small that they were almost impossible to find. The charts were also not necessarily aligned to magnetic north, making it difficult to work out which direction you were going in, let alone where you were. Two forward, three forward, direct Berlin, Paris said. 
I turned right slightly, guessing which way it must be. It was more than 200 miles away, and not even on the same chart. Normally, I'd have just punched it into the GPS. Paris asked us for confirmation. Two four three four confirm routing direct Berlin. We asked for a heading. They told us to turn right 10 degrees, and after 10 minutes or so, we managed to find where we were on the chart. We stayed on a radar heading until we picked up a bow VOR. We reached our destination without further difficulties, and I made a mental note to add cups of coffee to the list of things to watch out for on the flight deck. Track 32 Starfire 2516 Delta, we are uh, critical on fuel. Request vectors to um, Humber Field. Roger Starfire 16 Delta, turn right, right turn heading 200 degrees. Right turn to 200 degrees, 16 Delta. Are you declaring a fuel emergency? A firm, Starfire 16 Delta. Starfire 16 Delta, Roger. Turn for the right heading of 220, maintain altitude 3,000 feet. 220, 3,000 feet, 16 Delta. Um, my instruments don't seem to be working here. Can you vector us low enough to see the airport? Roger, 16 Delta. Um, my minimum vectoring altitude right now out there is only 2,700 feet. You can descend and maintain altitude 2,700 now. Descend altitude 2,700, 16 Delta. 16 Delta AFAM. Descend and maintain 2,700 feet. Confirm you are declaring a full emergency and stand by for further descent to altitude 2,000 feet. Roger. Current heading indicated is 260 degrees. 16 Delta. Sir, fly heading of 240. 240 degrees and descend now to 2,000 feet. Humber altimeter 29 decimal 9 of hour. 2,000 feet on 29 decibel 9 of hour and left to 240 degrees, 16 Delta. Um, I appear to have a problem with my compass. 16 Delta, Roger. Your present heading is good. This will be a no gyro surveillance approach to Humber Field. I will tell you to start and stop all turns. Confirm you can maintain 2,000 feet altitude. A firm and thank you, sir, 16 Delta. 16 Delta, turn right now. Turning right. Continue right turn. Wilco, 16 Delta. 16 Delta, stop turn now. Roger, 16 Delta. 16 Delta, the airport will be um, 12 o'clock at 4.5 miles. Ahead in 4.5 miles, I'm looking, 16 Delta. Roger, 16 Delta. Descend now and maintain 1,400 altitude. Descend 1,400, 16 Delta. 16 Delta A firm and Humber Tower advises clear to land on 27 left. Cleared land 27 left, 16 Delta. Distance to the airport? 16 Delta, you are four miles from the airport. Turn right. I say again, turn right now. Okay, turning right. Uh, uh, we are just visual now at 1,400 feet. Uh, stand by. Uh, yes, runway in sight for 16 Delta. We're heading straight for the threshold. 16 Delta, Roger. Continue visually. You are clear to land runway 27 left. Contact Humber Tower now. 120 decimal 5. Unless you just want to stay on this frequency. Negative. We'll contact tower on 120 decimal 5. Thanks for your help. Starfire 16 Delta. Track 33. This image is of an F-61 helicopter. A rescue helicopter. It's hovering at about 30 metres above the sea. It has an RAF roundel on it with rescue written on the front and the side of the aircraft. It's quite heavy because the blades are curved upwards. There's very little wind. In the background is a headland with what looks like a radar station, a white low building. But it's out of focus and it's difficult to know what it is. The cliffs of the headland go down to the sea. On the left side of the background you can see a few isolated rocks and the waves are no more than two or three feet. It's a nice gentle day, cloudless sky, probably quite hot, which is why the aircraft might be struggling a bit. There's no other activity at all. There's no operator of the hook visible and no obvious activity going on in the aircraft at all. 
The aircraft is a fully equipped SAR with a radar dome on the top. It's probably doing a practice exercise. Track 34 Can you describe the moment you realised something had first gone wrong? All of a sudden, there was an explosive bang sound, and the aircraft lurched very suddenly to the left. It dropped a little bit, and there was dust and a strong wind coming in. It depressurized significantly, and our ears really hurt. It all happened very quickly. People were crying and shouting. It was a very stressful situation. What were you thinking at the time? I was thinking that a window had popped out, or a cargo door had blown, and then the oxygen masks dropped down. <laughs> you sound very calm. Uh, did you think this was it? It's strange the things that go through your head. You're 30,000 feet in the air, and there's nothing between you and the ground. You just hope everything is going to be okay. We're just really grateful we got down safely. Absolutely. How much information did you get from the crew, and how long was it before you were safe on the ground? The cabin crew immediately ran to their seats and strapped themselves in. Nobody really knew what was going to happen. There was only one announcement to put your seat belt and masks on and stay seated. It probably took about 10 to 15 minutes until the pilot got us down to a low enough altitude so that we didn't have to use the oxygen masks. Gosh, what was the moment like when you touched the ground? Well, it was a relief. We all gave a round of applause. After seeing the gaping hole in the aircraft as I got off, I realized how lucky we were. Track 35 Stremmen approach, Delta Golf Hotel, Victor Tango. Delta Victor Tango, Stremmen approach, pass your message. Cessna 172 from Dortfeld to Stremmen, VFR 3,000 feet. Regional QNH 1012, estimating zone boundary 52 Stremen 2002. With information, Juliet, Delta Victor Tango. Delta Victor Tango is cleared from the zone boundary to Stremen, VFR at 3,000 feet. QNH 1010, traffic information. There is a northwest bound CRJ, 2 o'clock, 4,000 feet. IFR estimating zone boundary 53. Maintain 3,000 feet, QNH 1010. Traffic, um, not in sight, Delta Victor Tango. Delta Victor Tango, traffic is passing over you now, right to left, slightly above. Negative contact, Delta Victor Tango. Delta Victor Tango, roger. Report aerodrome in sight. We'll go, Delta Victor Tango. Aerodrome in sight, Delta Victor Tango. Delta Victor Tango, contact Stremen Tower 122, decimal 285. Stremen Tower 122, decimal 285, Delta Victor Tango. Stremen Tower, Delta Golf Hotel Victor Tango. Good evening, we are a Cessna 172, 8 miles east, altitude 3,000 feet, QNH 1010. Request straight in approach, runway 08. Delta Victor Tango, cleared straight in approach, runway 08. Surface wind uh, zero four uh, zero degrees five knots. QFE one zero zero six. Report final. Cleared straight in approach runway zero eight. QFE one zero zero six. Wilco Delta Victor Tango. Delta Victor Tango. Do you have your landing lights on? A firm Delta Victor Tango. Delta Victor Tango. Negative contact. Uh, safe position. Five miles east of Stremen, uh, estimating Stremen 2002, height 2,000 feet. Field in sight, Delta Victor Tango. Delta Victor Tango, we can't see you. What are you flying over now? Uh, it's getting pretty dark, but uh, we're over a main road uh, with a built-up area at my 10 o'clock, Delta Victor Tango. Delta Victor Tango, we believe you are approaching Draburg Airfield. Contact Stremen Radar on 128.850 for assistance. Stremen Radar on 128.850. Sorry about that, Delta Victor Tango. Track 36. There's a four-engine jet aircraft in a very clean and tidy hangar. There are maintenance engineers doing an inspection of number three engine. The fan cowlings are open and there's somebody in the intake inspecting the fan blades using a very bright light. It could be a new engine being installed, but there is no lifting equipment, 
so it looks more like a regular maintenance inspection. There's what looks like a computer screen on the table, which looks as if it's connected to the engine, and this indicates that they are doing some sort of diagnostic tests. The coloured lights are strange, maybe to detect particular problems, I don't know. It could be that they have fed fibre optic cables into the back end of the engine to inspect the turbine blades. Track 37 Hey Jim, take a seat. Hello guys. Morning. Everything okay? Yeah, fine. Slow start this morning. That APU is still inoperative. Haven't they fixed that yet? No. We had to fly six legs last week with that older pilot. Oh, it's a pain. I have complained about it, but nothing changes. <laughs> they get angry with me for complaining. That reminds me of DB. <laughs> Who's DB? We had this old 737 captain years ago, a guy we called DB. He had thousands of hours, and when they started introducing the new fleet, he gave up flying and became a dispatch officer at the company. One morning, a captain came to the briefing counter to pick up the release for his flight, and he noticed that the autopilot was inoperative. When he started complaining about it loudly in the office, DB looked at the captain and said, I flew 12,000 hours without an autopilot during the war, and you can't even fly to Roman back. <laughs> what did the captain say? <laughs> Nothing. He signed his dispatch release, and without saying another word, he quietly walked out of the office. Yeah, I remember that. I don't think that captain complained to DB again. <laughs> I once flew with an ex-Air Force captain who refused to take the aircraft because there was no lemon for his tea. We, we had an aircraft full of passengers who had to wait while the caterers found him a lemon. Lemons? Are they on the mail? <laughs> <laughs> Track 38 Sherwitzner Tower, flag line 46, on runway 26. We're going to have to hold position until we've sorted this out. Flag line 46, Chivitzner Tower, roger. All stations, Chivitzner Tower, runway 26, out of service due disabled aircraft. All traffic use runway 34 until further notice. Flag line 46, from the tower, it definitely looks like both the covers that close up after the wheels go up. It looks as though they are hanging down, dragging on the pavement. Roger, thank you. Flag line 46. Flag line 46, could we organize a tow for you? Negative. We think if we can get the doors lifted up and locked, then we will taxi the aircraft. But we can't move until then. Flag line 46. Flag line 46, do you want to disembark your passengers? Negative. We'd like to wait and disembark the passengers at the gate. Flag line 46. We need to get the main landing gear pinned. We have pins with us and we can throw them out of the window. Do you have anyone trained to fit them or is there maintenance on the field that can do it? Flag line 46. Flag line 46. We are checking if a mechanic is on site for you. Stand by. Flag line 46. There is a maintenance mechanic for your type available. He should be with you in a few moments. Thank you. Flag line 46. Track 39. This is a picture of an avionics engineer doing some fairly intricate work on a bank of avionic instruments inside an aircraft. The internal lights of the aircraft are on. He's wearing a t-shirt and jeans. He's wearing a watch on the left hand and his head is tilted back looking through his glasses. He's grimacing slightly, as if he's doing something fairly delicate with the bank of instruments in front of him. His two hands are upwards, and it's difficult to see, but in his left hand he's holding something, and probably trying to insert it into one of the banks of instruments. In front of him is a little tray sticking out from the instruments, on which looks like an MP3 player, but it's probably some sort of electrical instrument recording something that he's doing on the electronics itself. There's a tray or a trolley behind him to his left, which I suspect may be a container for his tools. Apart from that, it's a very ordinary picture of an engineer working quietly by himself in an aircraft. Track 40 So today I want us to focus on some of the common electrical problems that affect aircraft. Now often it's pilot error in responding to a problem that causes more difficulty than the problem itself. And today we're going to look at some examples. 
These reports are quite brief and don't have a lot of detail, but we can get the general idea. Here's a report about a Cessna 1A2, which states, electrical problem, overran runway, returning, alternator field wire loose, struck runway light. This happened during daytime using VFR. Could the pilot have handled the situation better? We don't know. But it is a bit strange that with such good visibility, the pilot hit the runway light. The next incident is even more common. An air taxi departed alternators off. This ended up with the batteries being drained and he had to lower the gear manually. Unfortunately, they weren't locked down and the result was a folded landing. The next report we're going to look at shows another alternated problem, this time a failure en route. In this case, the pilot was so busy trying to sort the alternator out that he landed gear up. And in our last example, while descending from altitude, a pilot did a long cruise descent with the engines at a very low power output. He was unaware that the aircraft had generators instead of alternators and that the engine speed on the descent was below the speed required to keep the battery charged. So let's have a look at these reports in a bit more detail. Track 41. Golf Bravo, Ghost Uniform Alpha, this is David Approach. Do you have any electronics at all? Ghost Uniform Alpha, I think I see you on radar. Believe to be tracking the coastline right now. Ghost Uniform Alpha, are you able to give me your heading? Ghost Uniform Alpha, are you able to give me a radio check? I believe I'm tracking you. Ghost Uniform Alpha, nothing heard. If you want to go to Cherbourg Airport, they have lights. I'll watch to see if you turn that way. I got you loud and clear now. Can you see Mont Saint-Michel? Dinar is an alternate. If you want to continue, I'll try to get the lights turned on. Golf Uniform Alpha, are you on a handheld radio right now? If we have to, we'll ask another aircraft to turn on the lights. They stay on for about one five minutes. Golf Uniform Alpha, there is no known traffic to conflict in the vicinity. I'm going to pass you over to Ren Approach on 124 Decimal Niner. Contact Ren now. Foxtrot Charlie Papa, can you see traffic out there? A Skyhawk about 2,500 and descending to the south of you. You may see him, but he has an electrical problem and may have no anti-collision beacon or strobes. Track 42. This is an amazing picture of an active volcano taken from an aircraft. The volcano is conical in shape with a central crater. It is erupting and there is a huge plume of thick volcanic ash rising from the crater to possibly several thousand feet into the sky and being blown to the left of the picture. There is also some steam or smoke coming from the rim of the crater. The upper sides of the volcano are brown with ash or lava deposits and there are gullies formed probably by previous eruptions. The lower slopes are covered with trees and there are some low-level clouds around the base of the volcano. In the distance, there is more high ground and it looks like a mountainous area. The sky is blue and the volcano is lit by the sun and, judging from the long shadows, I would say that the picture was taken in early morning or evening. The situation is dangerous for flight and ashtams or ash notams will have been issued to flight crews to warn them of the situation. Track 43 I'll open this seminar by talking about some of the major volcanic events that have affected aviation over the last 30 years or so. In the early 80s, several 747s encountered ash in Indonesia. One aircraft lost all four engines and descended from 36,000 feet to 12,500 feet before engines were restarted. The aircraft diverted to Jakarta and landed safely, but all four power plants had to be replaced before it returned to service. In 1989, a 747-400 with only 900 hours total flying time encountered an ash cloud in Alaska. Although it landed safely, the engines and many systems also had to be repaired or replaced, such as replacement of the aircraft environmental control system, cleaning of the fuel tanks, and repair of the hydraulic systems. 
In 1991, more than 20 aircraft encountered volcanic ash in the Philippines. This was the largest eruption of the past 50 years, and created an enormous plume of ash, making it very difficult to predict where the ash was. Commercial and military operations were affected. One U.S. operator even grounded its aircraft in Manila for several days due to thick ash fall. An eruption in Mexico affected operations in the region in the late 90s. Although damage was minor in most cases, one flight crew experienced reduced visibility for landing, and had to look through the flight deck side windows when taxiing. Mexico City Airport was closed for up to 24 hours on several occasions as the volcano continued to erupt. Track 44. Aziana 687, Cresco Control. Do you have any reports of volcanic ash on route? Asiana 687, I have no reports of volcanic ash at your flight level. We have had a faint smell of volcanic ash for about three or four minutes now. Asiana 687. Asiana 687, do you wish to change flight level? Negative. We'd like to keep flight level 11,600 meters. Asiana 687. Asiana 687, Roger. Grasco Control, a standard line fire tree tree, 110 kilometers from Cebu at flight level 10,600 meters. Negative volcanic ash in our area. Astana line, far tree tree, thank you. And、uh, Asiana 687, say position where you experienced the volcanic ash. We detected smell between 1 tree 0 kilometers from Cebu to 7 0 kilometers from Cebu. Flight level 11,600 meters. Asiana 687. Asiana 687, and can you describe the intensity? Light yellowy brown haze. Visibility about 300 or 400 meters. Asiana 687. Asiana 687. Do you have any idea which direction the cloud was moving? Um,、uh, direction of cloud movement was undetermined. At the time, wind was 050 degrees, about 28 meters per second. Asiana 687. Asiana 687. And just to confirm, you are now out of the cloud layer. We appear to be clear of the cloud layer at this time. Asiana 687. Asiana 687, thank you for the information. My pleasure, Asiana 687. CD3, track one. This is a sign showing dangerous items that are prohibited on board aircraft. Passengers are not allowed to take these things on board, either in hold luggage or in hand luggage. At the top, it says "Prepare for check-in," and then below, "Forbidden anywhere on the aircraft." And then there are drawings of different items in red circles with a red line crossing through them. The first three items are bottles. The first is a bottle of acid. The second is a bottle with a skull and crossbones on it, and the word poison below. And the third has a ball of flames, which I guess indicates flammable or explosive liquids. The next three show fireworks, matches, and a bottle saying bleach. I think. The final three show a torch or flashlight, if you are American, a canister saying "gas" on it, which looks like it is a camping stove, and finally a fire extinguisher. It's the sort of sign that you see on the counter when checking in your luggage, and when preparing to go through security at an airport anywhere in the world. They use symbols that everyone can understand, whatever language they speak. Track two. Dangerous goods are articles or substances which can cause a risk to health, safety, or to property when transported by air. Some of the more common types of items include such things as pesticides, petrol, acids, aerosols, and bleaches. Maybe it's okay to store these items in your home or transport them in your car on the way home from the shop because you know where they are and you know the possible dangers involved. At home, you might take precautions such as putting them in a high cupboard or a locked shed. You are careful to prevent someone swallowing or mishandling them. However, put them into the unfamiliar environment of an aircraft flying high in the sky, a place where they could be subject to severe atmospheric pressure and temperature variations, a place where there could be major vibrations, and many items behave in an unpredictable manner. For example, in a recent incident, while unloading baggage, the handlers noticed smoke 
rising from a suitcase. Investigation revealed that a quantity of book matches had caught a light. There have been several such incidents in recent years. Book matches can ignite when subject to the vibrations subjected to suitcases stacked in an aircraft cargo compartment. It can even happen when matches have been in pockets or briefcases. The most innocent-seeming goods can cause problems. Some dental supplies were being sent to Sydney. They included a glass container of a hundred milliliters of mercury. It broke during transport. And leaked into the hold of the aircraft. Luckily, it was discovered and cleaned up. If it hadn't, it could have weakened the skin of the aircraft with terrible consequences. Track three. Hi, we've got fumes in the cabin. What's the source? We don't know where it's coming from. It's past the、uh, exit. I guess it's from the cargo hold. We've got the H2O extinguisher. It's a real bad smell. The floor is getting really warm. Okay. Now,、uh, how far back is the floor getting warm? It's about midway through to. About where the landing gear might be. You don't see any smoke. It's just fumes. Bad fumes. It's starting to hurt my eyes. Okay. I'm gonna get off the phone. Call me if anything important changes. Captain, it's me again. You've got a big problem back here, so I'm not sure if you. I'm not sure. The, the, the problem is I don't know where the heat is coming from. It, it's coming up through the floor. Do you see any smoke? There's smoke coming through the floor. Okay, okay. The floor is getting very hot. Okay, we're number one to land. We'll be on the ground soon. Prepare for an immediate evacuation. Track four. Here there are two Northwest Airlines aircraft, what look like an Airbus and an MD80. The two aircraft seem to have collided, so it looks like the scene of an accident on an airfield, close to stand G12. It appears the MD80 has taxied into the Airbus, or the Airbus has been pushed back into the other one, but there's no tug there, so I don't know. The MD80 seems to be lodged under the Airbus. It looks like the trailing edge of the right wing of the larger of the two is slicing into the top of the fuselage, above the cockpit area of the smaller one. The underside of the Airbus empennage appears to have made contact with the MD-80 as well. Fire service and attendants are present, and it looks like they've got breathing equipment and suits on. And there are a number of people and ground staff standing around assessing the situation. I guess there are no passengers on board because the forward chutes on the far side of the Airbus have been deployed, and there are step ladders next to the MD-80. The surface looks like it is covered in foam, or it is slippery or icy. I'm not sure. The photograph was taken at night or very early in the morning. The area is brightly floodlit. Track five. Did you hear what happened at Heathrow yesterday with the A340 and the 747? Ah,、oh, where the Sri Lankan taxied into the BA. Yep, caused a few problems, but there wasn't too much damage, no injuries. I heard that a bunch of passengers refused to fly on the 340 today because the wingtip was missing. Hey, I thought it was the Sri Lankan Airbus's right leading edge that struck the winglet on the BA, not the other way round. That's right. The BA was stationary and the Sri Lankan was passing to the left.、Mm. Couldn't the three forty fly easily without a wingtip? Yeah, I thought that was possible. Yes, it is, as far as I know. An A three eighty flew after one of its tips clipped the hangar gate at Bangkok, but they removed both wingtips and the aircraft flew okay. Ah,、uh, I'm not so sure. Are wingtips on the CDL? No, they're not. But I'm pretty sure that CDLs don't cover taking off equipment damaged in accidents. I wonder who was out of position yesterday. The taxi and parking lines are supposed to guarantee clearance. Not necessarily. They've recently repaved the holding point where it happened, and the airport documents say wingtip clearance not assured. Take care when passing. Yeah, at Seattle Tower once, a China Airlines A340 was taxiing at a gate, and as it taxied on the taxiway center line, the right winglet struck an American MD80's horizontal stabilizer, <laughs> even though it was parked. And <laughs> did it fly afterwards? Yeah. It left a few hours later, one winglet short.
Track 6. Golf, Juliet, golf. Line up and wait, runway 08. Keep to the right-hand side. There will be traffic backtracking opposite direction. You are number one for departure. Line up and wait on the right-hand side, runway 08. Golf, Juliet, golf. Golf, Mike Echo. Backtrack runway 08. Keep to the right-hand side. Traffic on runway. Backtracking and Wilco. Traffic copied. Golf, Mike Echo. Golf Echo Romeo, turn left base, report final. The number one to land. Turning base, we'll go Golf Echo Romeo. Golf Mike Echo, after the Cessna, vacate right and taxi to Apron 2 via Taxiway Bravo. Apron 1 via Taxiway Bravo, after the Cessna. Golf Mike Echo. Golf Juliet, Golf, the Piper just brushed our left wing tip. Golf Echo Romeo, final. Golf Mike Echo, hold position. Holding, Golf Mike Echo. Golf Echo Romeo, go around, I say again, go around and report again on downwind. Going around, we'll go. Golf Echo Romeo. Golf Juliet, Golf, are you okay? We're okay, the Piper just clipped our wing. Request permission to step out of the aircraft to have a look at the damage. Golf Juliet, Golf. Golf Juliet, Golf approved. Tower, Golf Juliet, Golf. Request permission to taxi back to the apron and the Piper is able to do the same. Golf Juliet Golf, so you're both able to move, no problem? A firm, Golf Juliet Golf. Golf Mike Echo, vacate right and taxi to Apron 2 via Taxiway Bravo. Apron 2 via Bravo, Golf Mike Echo. Golf Juliet Golf, follow the Piper to Apron 2 via Taxiway Bravo. When you've parked, could you telephone me and report any damage? Follow the Piper and Wilco, Golf Juliet Golf. Track 7. This is an extraordinary picture. When you first look at it, it's difficult to orientate yourself. There are two aircraft on an apron with a lot of people looking around. It looks as if an Air France aircraft has had its tail sliced off by another aircraft, of which you can only see part of the wing. There is a logo on the wing that looks like a Far East logo. You can only partly see the aircraft. You can see the engine and a bit of the wing. Although you can see damage on the wing of the aircraft, it's only minor. But the damage to the Air France aircraft is major. It's sliced the tail fin and elevators completely off, which are lying beside the aircraft on the ground. Around it are three or four people with mobiles, which they're using to take pictures. They are wearing high-visibility vests. In the very centre of the picture, there is a lady not wearing a vest, and to the side, a couple of supervisors in white shirts. There is a rescue vehicle stationary on the left-hand side of the foreground of the picture, with a driver wearing a helmet. In the background, there are five vans with a number of people coming out. It looks as if they've got cameras as well. The sky is clear. Track 8 A terrible earthquake has cut off all land routes into Xiang province. The only possible way to get supplies into the area was by making an airdrop. A special reconnaissance force was assembled and sent into the area most affected by the quake. Fifteen parachutists were dropped from a record-breaking 4,000 meters. To add to the difficulty, they were forced to land without any help from ground crew and there were not any specific landmarks. Once the parachutists had landed, they provided information to the Air Force about where to drop supplies. Five tons of aid materials, including food and water, were delivered. The supplies were dropped by an EU-76 aircraft from 5,800 meters. This is quite an unusual operation for this type of aircraft. Normally, the airdrops take place at about 600 meters above sea level. But even though the terrain was so difficult and the weather conditions so poor, the Air Force were able to complete their mission. Colonel Wang, the leader of the reconnaissance group, explained the difficulties the reconnaissance group had to deal with. Of course, it was a very difficult and dangerous situation, but we had a job to do. We had to make sure that all the food was dropped in the right places and not scattered around the countryside. Because we were in the middle of the mountains and the visibility was so bad, uh, it was hard to find the goods. But because of the dedication and skill of my team, we were able to locate and distribute the much-needed supplies. Track 9 
Eastern 865, approach. Eastern 865, Rezovac, approach. Air Trans 323, the aircraft behind you appears to have a comms failure. Vectors for separation. Reduce speed 200 knots, fly heading 220 degrees. Speed 200 knots, heading 220 degrees, Air Trans 323. Press advance approach, Echo India Tango Foxtrot Charlie. Request clearance to join Foxtrot 2 at Dorat, maintaining flight level 150. Echo India Tango Foxtrot Charlie, negative. Remain outside controlled airspace due aircraft in emergency situation. We'll go Echo India Tango Foxtrot Charlie. Army Air 232, can you increase speed 350 knots to cross Foxtrot 2 at Dorat, flight level 150, time 19 or before? At present mass, max speed is 320, Army Air 232. Army Air 232, Roger, cancel clearance to cross Foxtrot 2 due to traffic with suspected radio failure. Remain outside controlled airspace, expect further clearance at time 21. Remain outside controlled airspace, Army Air 232. Eastern 865, Rezovac approach. Eastern 865, Rezovac approach. Sunbird 223, traffic information. Traffic is an Eastern A320-200 with radio failure. 12 o'clock, 3 miles crossing right to left below. Traffic inside Sunbird 223. Air Trans 323, fly heading 3 hours 0 degrees. Heading 3 hours 0 degrees, we have the eastern sight at our 2 o'clock, Air Trans 323. Air Trans 323, we tried to slow him down and put him behind you, but we cannot contact him. Continue right turn, direct, let's go. Continue right turn, direct, let's go. Air Trans 323. Eastern 625, hold at let's go, flight level 110. Expect onward clearance at time 27. Holding at Lesco, flight level 110, Eastern 625. Rezovaj Center, Eastern 865. We are declaring an emergency now. We've got serious problems with our electrics and radios. We're trying to ascertain the cause now. Eastern 865, Rezovaj Center. Roger, understand you are declaring a mayday. Track 10. In this picture, we're looking at an aircraft being refueled. It's at what looks to be quite a large airfield. It's difficult to say where exactly that airfield is, although in the background we have a wooded hillside and it's a cloudy greyish day. So I would think we're probably in Europe, perhaps in spring or early summer. The aircraft is probably a Boeing and it's being refuelled from underground fuel tanks via a vehicle. The vehicle is taking the fuel from the underground tanks and the fuel is being pumped by a refuelling attendant. I think the attendant is about to connect or disconnect the refuelling pipe to the underwing of the aircraft. The ground handler is wearing high visibility clothing, so he's got day glow clothing on. The vehicle is white, the usual colour of the refuelling vehicles at airports. I think the aircraft is probably a modern 737 with a nice wingtip. Track 11. The latest aircraft produced by Airbus is the amazing A380. But passengers on board the Premier A380s have had to wait a bit longer before being able to fly on them, due to recurring problems with the aircraft's fuel tank systems, which have affected a number of the fleet's A380 aircraft. The problems began last week when two of the airline's A380s were grounded at Boston Airport after experiencing fuel-related problems. One is due to return to service at 5.40 p.m. tonight, and the other tomorrow. In a related incident, the airline's flagship was delayed yesterday in Dallas, before eventually being cleared to fly to Paris. However, on arrival at Charles de Gaulle Airport, it was again found to be leaking fuel, and experienced a nose-wheel steering issue, and was declared unserviceable. In the latest development, Premier was forced to declare another of the aircraft unserviceable last night, after scores of passengers had waited more than 12 hours for a fuel leak to be repaired. 
A spokeswoman for Premair said it was natural to expect teething problems with a new aircraft, and the airline was working with Airbus to resolve the issues. She said their engineers are currently working on the aircraft, and they hope to have them back in service very soon. She went on to say that they are working very closely with Airbus and remain committed to the A380 as the cornerstone of their new generation, and they apologize to their customers. Is the A380 worth the wait? Contact us with your views. Track 12 Flyfast 001, Filton Tower. Flyfast 001, pass your message. Flyfast 001, request your intentions. What do you want to do? Stand by. Flyfast 001. Flyfast 001, we're talking to company at the moment and we're trying to decide whether to continue or come back. We'll give you a call in a minute, maybe for vectors to downwind. Flyfast 001. We're going to return to the airport and it looks like we're going to have to dump fuel. Stand by, but we're coming back. Fly fast, 001. 001, understand you're going to come back and you need to dump fuel. Fuel dumping area is in the Seven Estuary. Suggest start dumping fuel five miles north of Lundy Island. I'll give you vectors to filter on completion. Fly heading 210 degrees. Fly fast, 001, once you get 20 DME from Filton, you can start to dump fuel. To what DME? Fly fast 001, two zero miles. Do you know the nature of your problem? It's a flat problem. We can't retract the flaps below 10%. Roger. Fly fast 001, do you have an estimate on how long you'll be dumping fuel for? We're just checking now. We want to dump about 70,000 kilos. It's going to take about 30 minutes. We'll try to find a figure where we can land overweight. Track 13. The dominant feature of this picture is the people in a playing field standing in a formation which spells the word NO in capital letters. There are several hundred demonstrators in formation, all facing the camera, and they seem to be holding orange placards, but I can't see what the placards say. There are also other small groups of people dotted around the playing field. Around the edge of the playing field are trees, and beyond the trees on the left is a residential area with semi-detached houses and what looks like a fire station tower, and in the centre and on the right are industrial buildings and warehouses and a tall white chimney with a black top. In the distance I can see an airfield and dozens of parked aircraft, a very large hangar to the right and gas storage tanks in the centre. Track 14 Protesters converged on Heathrow Airport in London again today to say no to airport expansion. Pilots on departure from the northern runway reported seeing thousands of protesters form a massive no sign in the village of Sipson, just north of the airport, which will be destroyed if the planned third runway is built. Pilots have invited environmental campaigners at Heathrow to participate in discussions about climate change issues. British Airline Pilots Association Chairman, Captain Mervyn Granshaw, said that talking about climate change is better than any direct action. This incident comes four months after environmental activists breached security at Heathrow and climbed on top of an aircraft. Four people were arrested after hanging a banner reading Climate Emergency No Third Runway from the vertical stabiliser of a British Airways Airbus A320. Two women and two men, dressed in high-visibility jackets, managed to get past airside security and across the apron. They climbed up the aft passenger steps and then onto the aircraft via a jetway. BAA, the airport operator, said operations at the airport were not affected and described the protests as unlawful and irresponsible. Climate change is a hot political issue in the UK. A number of other airports have seen environmental protests over the past few months, including Stansted, Biggin Hill and East Midlands Airport, where 24 protesters broke through security fencing and occupied a taxiway for several hours, causing minor disruption. Track 15 1 Air France 03 Far Heavy, line up and wait runway 19 left. Line up and wait, runway 19 left, Air France 03 Far Heavy. 
Airways 247, vacate next left taxiway Golf. Hold short of runway 19 left. Next left and hold short of runway 19 left. On landing, we could see a balloon to the southeast of the airfield. Looks like a white helium weather balloon, about um, 300 feet, tracking northwest bound. Air West 247. Air West 247, Roger, thank you. Break, break. Air France 03 Fower Heavy, did you copy that transmission? Stay firm, balloon in sight, request permission to hold until the balloon has passed. Air France 03 Fower Heavy. Air France 03 Fower Heavy, hold position. Track 16. Two. Alpha Victor 523, caution, work in progress ahead, north side of taxiway Alpha. There's a building equipment on the taxiway. I think they're about to move it. Request hold this position until clear to proceed. Alpha Victor 523. Alpha Victor 523, roger, hold position and advise when it is clear to proceed. Track 17. Three. Tower Biz Air 887, we saw a lot of people at the western perimeter fence on departure from runway 27 left. Some appear that to be climbing over onto the airfield. Biz Air 887, thank you. We have security personnel on their way now. Track 18. 4. Tower Solar 7459. Do you see something on the approach over the threshold of 22 right? It looks like a parachute. It looks like some guy on a paraglider. KLM 60 Fowler. Solar 7 Fowler 59er, we'll get someone over there to have a look at it. Police 123, Tower. Tower, Police 123, pass your message. Police 123, we've got someone on what we think is a paraglider above the threshold of 22 right. Request you investigate. Roger, we'll go. Police 123. Track 19. This is a picture or an image of an aircraft right at the end of a non tarmac strip. In the midground, there is a series of chalets and houses, and in the background are mountains. In the centre of the background, the picture is dominated by one particular mountain, with snow on the top. The sky is clear, with fair weather cumulus scattered around it. The vegetation is fairly sparse, mostly rock and scrub, with probably gorse and fir trees around the place. And now we come on to the interesting part, which is the aircraft on the end of a strip. It's a twin-engine aircraft. The engines are going, but it's difficult to know whether the aircraft has just come to a halt after landing, or it's about to take off. There is a man on the left-hand side, dressed in a shirt and trousers, watching, He's certainly not part of the crew or a marshal. The aircraft is obviously not moving because there's no dust being pushed up on the strip. As an aviator, it's an interesting picture because I imagine the overshoot or the approach is only one direction down the valley. So if the wind was wrong, it would be a very interesting approach or overshoot with little choice between the two. Track 20 the capital of Honduras is a place called Tegucigalpa. The airport there is extremely interesting because of its difficult approach and because of its surprisingly short runway. It's one of my all-time favorites. The runway is only 6,132 feet long. The city is in a basin between several tall mountains and the airport was built on a plateau south of the city. The approach into Tegucigalpa is amazing. Up until a few years ago, there used to be a small hill some 200 feet from the runway. Aircraft used to have to fly low, ascend the hill, and descend into Tegucigalpa. This was flattened during the early 1990s in order to make the approach less dangerous. The result is an approach which is much safer, but equally as interesting. An aircraft landing on runway 01 must circle inside the basin below the mountaintops. I love looking up at the wing and still seeing trees and mountains while being banked the other way. After it circles the basin, the pilot has only 100, 200 feet to line up before the runway. As soon as the aircraft crosses the fence separating the airport property and the highway, it must make contact. 
The runway has a displaced threshold. It's impossible to touch down at the beginning, leaving only 5,436 feet of usable landing runway. That short runway, coupled with a 1.06 degree downhill slope on runway 01, allows for little braking time. I've flown into quite a few unusual places, but for me, nothing beats the thrill of witnessing the skill of pilots as they complete this incredible landing. Track 21 X-ray Tango 3, you are not cleared through the approach corridor. Leave the approach corridor and remain to the north. I didn't copy that. Say again, X-ray Tango 3. X-ray Tango 3, you were too close to the extended centerline of the approach. Remain north of runway 27, landing traffic on 4 mile final. Flipping for the traffic and will remain north of the center line, X-ray Tango 3. X-ray Tango 3, request. X-ray Tango 3, pass your message. We need to check the routine of the convoy. Request to cross the center line to the south, X-ray Tango 3. X-ray Tango 3, negative. Remain to the north of runway 27. Traffic on short final, report that traffic in sight. Remain north of the active Wilco, X-ray Tango 3. Traffic in sight, X-ray Tango 3. X-ray Tango 3, cross behind that traffic. We do not need to cross behind because we will stay on the western side of the airport. X-ray Tango 3, roger and remain north of runway 27 until landing traffic on runway. Roger, confirm that we can cross after the aircraft lands, X-ray Tango 3. X-ray Tango 3, AFA. X-ray Tango 3, cross runway and clear to land on the H surface, wind 260 degrees 8 knots. Clear to land on the H, X-ray Tango 3. X-ray Tango 3, turn right and hover taxi to the terminal. Contact ground on 121 decimal 90. Wilco and contact ground 121 decimal 90, X-ray Tango 3. Track 22. In this picture, I can see the result of a fire in an air traffic control tower. The fire has been extinguished, and there are no flames or smoke. However, there is a blackened area and fire damage around the left of the tower below the windows, and the fire seems to have affected four of the windows, but the roof seems to be fine. I doubt whether an aircraft has hit it, because there is no debris from an impact. It could have been the result of terrorist action, perhaps an explosion, but it definitely looks as if there has been an external fire. I suppose the facility has been evacuated and the airport must be closed because it wouldn't be possible to provide air traffic control services in this situation. There are around five firefighting personnel on the roof below the observation deck wearing high visibility clothing and helmets. Track 23 Mohammed. Could you tell us what happened on the approach? Yeah, the planned approach took us around the DME arc to join finals for runway 08. It was a moonless night and the controller was reporting scattered cloud. So, all was well? Yes. As we came around the arc, everything was fine. Glide slope capture happened almost immediately after the approach mode was selected and everything became rushed. The aircraft began to accelerate as it pitched down and was a lot faster than it should be. But there were no flags, no warnings, so we concentrated on managing the speed. But something was still bugging you. Exactly. After we completed the landing checklist, I began to think again. Why were we going so fast? Why were we using the speed brake and gear? Right. We were looking for something to confirm the ILS indications. We couldn't see the airfield clearly as expected and thought that maybe this was due to the reported cloud. Then the first officer looked out to the side and was surprised to see the lights from a village were so close. That was the second surprise? Yes. At the same time, I was doing a DME crash check, but the answer didn't agree with the ILS indications. That was enough surprises for us. Wherever we were, we were where we were not supposed to be, and we both called to go around. OK. And what did you do then? Once we were at a safe altitude, we discussed the, the problem and concluded that the glide slope was faulty and could not be trusted. We planned a second approach using the localizer and ignoring the 
on glide path indication. And that's good crew resource management. Track 24. 1. All stations, all stations. Radar has failed. I say again, the radar has failed. All aircraft return to previously assigned headings and levels. Aircraft are to adhere strictly to ATC instructions. Track 25. 2. We've overshot the runway here. Interlink 7 Fire Tree. Interlink 7 Fire Tree. Roger. What assistance do you require? We couldn't make out the end of the runway at all. Interlink 7 Fire Tree. Interlink 7 Fire Tree. The runway and indicator lights are unserviceable. We didn't copy that in the no terms. Uh, we'll need help getting back on the tarmac. Interlink 7 Fire Tree. Interlink 7 Fire Tree. Roger. We're sending out a vehicle now. Will you require any support for your passengers? Uh, negative. Interlink 7 Fire Tree. Track 26. 3. Net Air 887, hold position. I'm getting a radar indication there's another aircraft on the runway. Net Air 887, holding. Net Air 887, we stop short of the intersection with runway 19er. We have negative visual contact with another aircraft on the runway. Net Air 887, radar indicates it is behind you now, but it may be an erroneous return. Negative contact with any other aircraft. Net Air 887. Roger, Net Air 887, you are clear to cross runway 19 and vacate next left. Track 27. 4. Automarker inbound, Korean 327. Korean 327, roger. This is Korean 327. We've just lost contact with the runway lights. Korean 327, say again. We can't see the runway lights at all, beyond the touchdown zone. Your edge and uh, center line lights are out. We are making a missed approach. Korean 327. Korean 327, roger. This is Swift Tail 653 at holding position Alpha 8. To confirm what the Korean 327 said, you've completely lost the runway edge and center line lighting. The runway's pitch black up here. Swift Tail 653, roger. We'll get the engineers onto it right away. Track 28. In this picture, it looks like there has been quite a nasty accident. There is a large vehicle, maybe the sort of passenger carrying vehicle that takes passengers from the terminal to the aircraft, and it has turned over on its side. I can see the underside and the front end of the vehicle. It has three sets of wheels, one at the front and two at the back. It looks like the axle is bent at the right-hand front wheel, and the front end is quite badly damaged. There is a big dent on the left side, and it looks like the windscreen has smashed away completely. In the foreground, there is a lot of debris over the ground, including some quite large pieces of bent and twisted metal. Behind the vehicle, and on the right side of the picture, there is a set of air stairs, which indicates that the accident occurred at an airfield, and an aircraft was involved in some way. I have no idea what could have caused this accident. Maybe the vehicle was moving too fast and swerved to avoid something, but it looks more likely that there was a collision. It must have been quite serious, because it would take a pretty big force or impact to turn a large vehicle like this over. Track 29 when people think of a near-miss in aviation, it's usually the possibility of aircraft colliding. However, the pilot of a bombardier at Plimstock Airport was startled to see a mechanical digger heading directly towards his aircraft just after ATC had cleared him for takeoff. The digger came within inches of hitting the aircraft and was seconds away from causing a disaster. Our reporter at the scene spoke to Tony Roberts, the manager for the airport authority. One. The incident was a serious near miss. Two. Yes, we have strict procedures in place. All traffic, whether truck or aircraft, must contact ATC to get clearance before crossing any taxiways or runways. The driver of the vehicle should have stopped at the intersection of runway 22 left and the taxiway and then waited for clearance. Three. 
We are investigating the causes right now. A new taxiway is being built, and the driver was part of the construction team. Four. An alarm sounded in the control tower, indicating that something was on the runway just after they'd cleared the aircraft. The controller saw the digger and tried to contact the driver, who didn't have the radio on. Moments later, the pilot saw the approaching truck. Five. He is currently helping the authorities with their investigations. Track thirty. Nine zero one five left via Foxtrot and Alpha. When you get to Yankee, follow Korean Air. Okay, left Foxtrot, Yankee, and then Yankee Papa Bravo. You said. Negative. When you get to Yankee, follow Korean Air. Ah,、uh, follow Korean Air. United nine zero one five. Ground. Korean two five seven. We think we hit a vehicle. A truck near the taxiway. I'm sorry. You think you hit a vehicle? Yes. Okay, Korean two five seven. Hold your position. Holding position. United nine zero one five. Do you see anything near Korean Air? I'm looking. I don't see anything. Does he think he's just hit something? United nine zero one five. A firm. He said that there might be a vehicle damaged or something. Check on right side, please. Okay, we're looking at the right side. I don't see anybody who looks upset. We'll take a closer look. Ground United 901 Fire. It's really hard to tell. There is a vehicle parked there. Maybe his outboard engine hit it. I can't tell from here. Roger United. Thank you very much. Korean 257. A follow me vehicle is on its way to you. They'll make a visual inspection. Roger. Thank you, Korean 257. Korean two five seven ground. Pass your message two five seven. Yeah, the airport vehicle is inspecting the right side of the aircraft. Can you cut the engines? Say again, Korean two five seven. Cut your engines down to idle. They're already at idle. Do you want us to shut down the engines? A firm two five seven. Shut down your engines. Track thirty one. This is a picture of half a runway. The runway leads away from the foreground directly into some hills. It's a very basic runway which is in a bit of disrepair, although the centre line markings look as if they've been newly painted. There's no taxiway, and on either side is burnt grass. Past the grass, there are some low one-storey buildings with tin roofs. Only one building is two storeys. The buildings and airstrip are on a flat plain overlooked by mountains and hills. You can see a taxiway at the end nearest, which turns into a sad-looking dispersal area. The hills are the dominant feature. They tower above the runway. They are covered with green vegetation. It's an interesting picture in that you have the magnificence of nature overlooking the rather sad endeavours of mankind. Track thirty-two. A. I stopped at the stop sign. I looked in both directions and didn't see any aircraft. I put my flashing lights on. All the exterior lights, running lights, and headlights were on, and the interior lights were off. To my right, I noticed the nose taxi lights of an aircraft, and I carefully moved forward. I stopped, looked both ways, and then drove across the cargo ramp. I heard the controller repeatedly telling the aircraft to hold, at least. I assumed the message was for the aircraft. The next thing, there was a bright light, and I was thrown to the floor. B. We pushed back and started the engine. Ramp control gave clearance to my first officer to taxi and hold at Bravo. We were on our way there when he suddenly shouted, "Bus!" From my seat on the left, I saw the bus. But even though I braked as hard as I could, was unable to stop before we hit the bus. It just kept coming. As far as I could see, there were not any lights on the bus. C. I was sitting on the right-hand side at the back, looking left. We stopped at the sign and then carried on across the cargo ramp. I could see that there was an aircraft getting closer and closer, and I repeatedly shouted at the driver to look out, but he didn't do anything. D. Once we'd pushed back, we were given clearance to taxi and hold short of the taxiway at Foxtrot Alpha. There was an inbound aircraft holding short of the cargo ramp, waiting for us to exit. All the runway lights were on.
I just finished the checklist when I saw something dark on my side on the right. I couldn't see any lights in the vehicle. I shouted bus to the captain. We crashed and I was hurt. Track 33 Mayday, 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 Spire Tower, Rotary Tower 2, Robinson R11, three miles east of the field, height 800 feet, heading zero, power zero degrees. My fuel gauge is reading empty and the auxiliary gauge is reading low. Suspect rapid leak. Rotary Tower 2, Spire Tower. Roger, Mayday. Say intentions. Unable to proceed to the field, making a full power landing on playing field east of Spira. Stand by, Rotary Tower 2. Rotary Tower 2, Roger. Spira Tower, Rotary Tower 2. Rotary Tower 2, pass your message. We sat down on the playing field and shut down. The fuel tanks are almost dry. I have spoken with dispatch and I'm awaiting instructions. I'll contact you once I know more. Rotary Tower 2. Track 34 Yoshi, radar. Starjet 872. Starjet 872, pass your message. Coding at Matsu flight level 1, power 0. Request update on weather. Starjet 872. Starjet 872, visibility still below landing minima at Minawa. Starjet 872, approaching minimum fuel. Request immediate diversion to Nagazawa. Starjet 872, Clear direct TOTA, flight level 1, power 0. Contact Nagazawa approach 129.350. Track 35. Kuria 25 power, Kujuk Center, B737700, 32 miles west of Milau. Flight level 320, heading 2 power 0 degrees. Request descent and landing at uh, Kelandan. Korea 25 power, Roger. Descent flight level 180. Do you have a problem with your flight? Leaving flight level 320, descending flight level 180. AFM, we have low fuel pressure for engine number 2 and an indication of fuel imbalance. Korea 25 power. Track 36. This is a picture of a crashed aircraft lying in the foreground. The aircraft has obviously landed heavily, so heavily that the wings are bent downwards, the spar is cracked on one of them. The undercarriage is splayed either side of the aircraft. The propeller is bent and the engine is coming out of the cowling. It has a striped fuselage. Nobody is in it. It looks as if the windscreen has been broken and there is relatively little damage to the tailplane or elevators. However, the impact has obviously been heavily down as opposed to along, and the whole aircraft is damaged, with two drooping wings. The setting is nondescript, a sparse wooded area on a fairly flat plain, a blue sky dotted with fair weather cumulus, and some strata as well. Looks as if a front may be coming in from a distance, although the visibility is extremely good. This is a sad picture of an aircraft that will probably never fly again. Track 37. Hello, guys. Hey there. Hey. How's it going? Oh, pretty exhausted. Long day today. You know, I left the flight deck just 15 minutes inside the 16-hour limit this evening. Hmm. What time did you show up this morning? Uh, reported in at 5 a.m., out of bed just after 3, flew five legs in total, and had to wait in Munich for three hours because of the snow. Sounds like my day. Yeah, <laughs> sounds like a normal day in the office. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the day when I get a job for a long-haul airline. I can cope with the jet lag. I just struggle with these long days. Mm, much easier for long-haul pilots. They get a break every eight hours at the controls. Mm. Regional flights somehow don't get this protection. Short-haul airlines seem to think we're machines who can just switch on and switch off. There are some regional patterns on the roster now at my company that involve a 12 and a half hour duty with not even a 15-minute break. <laughs> yes, and you can only leave the flight deck for a walk around or to use the bathroom. Even eat at the controls. Did you know that bus drivers have more restrictions than pilots at our company? <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> I was talking to a Canadian pilot a few years ago who said they can work 42 days straight without a day off. Now that's tough. Yeah. 
He was saying in Canada you can do 150 hours flying in one month and up to 60 flight hours in one week. I think these flight and duty time standards favour the operator rather than safety. It's all about making money. Look on the bright side, though. I was reading that the European Aviation Safety Agency has started work on new pilot fatigue rules. Mm, I heard that, too. Let's hope they really will be based on science rather than on commercial pressures. I mean, there's loads of scientific research on the issue, but the regulations just don't consider it, which is crazy. Yeah, I think the FAA in the States is going to review the rules like they're doing in Europe. Did you hear about that fatigue risk management system forum? Well, that looks promising. What's that? Uh, some airlines have got together to discuss best practice with human fatigue management. They've got some pretty big names, Air New Zealand, EasyJet, Delta, Virgin. Mm -hmm. They're going to produce guidance for airlines to set up their own fatigue management systems. Oh, our company would really benefit from a system like that. Yeah, they could start by putting us up in a decent hotel. And a good night's sleep would be very nice. Yeah, I always get woken up when the bar closes at 2am. The walls are so thin, I only ever get about four hours sleep when we stay here. All our crew members get tired, not just us. And people wonder why pilots nap on the flight deck. Track 38. Zoom Fower 6 Fower, taxi to holding point runway 25 right via Bravo. Taxi to holding point runway 25 right via Bravo. Zoom Fower 6 Fower. Tiger 236, cleared for takeoff runway 25 right, wind 200 degrees, 19 knots. Cleared for takeoff runway 25 right, Tiger 236. Albion 291, vacate next right, taxi to South Apron via Mike, give way to the A340 inbound on Lima. Next right, taxi to South Apron via Mike, we'll cope, Albion 291. India Fowler 5, Yankee Charlie, line up and wait runway 25 right. Line up and wait, runway 25 right, India Fire 5, Yankee Charlie. Tiger 236, stopping. Tiger 236, roger. Oscar Oscar, golf, cleared to land, runway 25 left. Wind 200 degrees, 21 knots. Cleared to land, runway 25 left. Oscar Oscar, golf. Tiger 236, say reason for stop. We had a low oil pressure indication for engine number one. Readings are now normal. Request another departure. Tiger 236. Tiger 236, Roger. Vacate left taxiway Echo. Taxi to the holding point runway 25 right via Bravo. Vacate left taxiway Echo. Taxi to the holding point runway 25 right via Bravo. Thank you. Tiger 236. India Fire 5 Yankee Charlie. Aircraft vacating runway. Expect departure in two minutes. India Fire 5 Yankee Charlie. Albion 291, hold position. I told you to give way. Holding, we slid across Lima on black ice. Albion 291. Albion 291, Roger. Braco 878, hold position. Holding, we watched him skid right out in front of us. Braco 878. Oscar, Oscar, Golf, vacate next right, taxiway India. Hold short of Lima. Advise slow speed. We have reports of poor braking action on the south taxiways. Next right, taxi India. Roger. Oscar, Oscar, Golf. Tinevet Tower, India Fire 5, Yankee Charlie. There's a group of rodents running around in the field over here. India Fire 5, Yankee Charlie, say again. A few animals. I can't see what species. Out here on the right side of runway 25 right, India Fire 5, Yankee Charlie. India Fire 5, Yankee Charlie, Roger, thank you. Albion 291, are you able to continue taxi? Steering is going to be an issue. We'd prefer a tow. Albion 291. Albion 291, Roger. We'll send a vehicle to you now. India Fire 5, Yankee Charlie. Cleared for takeoff runway 25 right. Wind 200 degrees, 21 knots. Cleared for takeoff runway 25 right. India Fire 5, Yankee Charlie. Chintavich Tower. Zoom Fire 6 Fire. Request return to the North Apron. Zoom Fire 6 Fire. Turn next right taxiway Charlie and hold position. Do you have a problem? We have a party of 16 kids on board who've lost their passports. We need to get this sorted out. Zoom Fire 6 Fire. Zoom Fire 6 Fire. Roger. Hold position. Traffic is just arriving at stand 23. We'll need to find a parking position for you. Turn next right taxiway Charlie and hold position. Zoom Fire 6 Fire. Track 39.
This is a picture that gives the impression of heat and movement. In the foreground, there is a photographer standing by a tripod on which is a camera. He's in shirt sleeves and with what looks like a small rucksack on his back. He's standing next to the tripod operating the camera amongst some scrub which has been dried by the sun, and he is taking a photograph or filming a jet aircraft which looks like a 777 taking off from a runway. There is shimmering heat the whole way around the aircraft. You can see the heat from the two huge engines, and you can hardly see the background at all because of the shimmer of the heat. The nose has lifted, the nose wheel is maybe 20 feet in the air, and the main wheels are probably just about to lift. The angle is quite steep, and the tail is close to the runway, but there is no sign of dust or debris, which you would expect if there was contact between the tail and the ground in a tail strike. The aircraft is quite close to the photographer, who I imagine will be blasted by the engines. I would run if I was him. Apart from that, the background is sand, desert type scrub with a clear, cloudless sky. The aircraft is not particularly in focus, so it's difficult to know which company it belongs to. Indistinguishable markings on the fuselage. Track 40. This month's FlightWeb podcast looks at the topic of staff shortage in air traffic control. With me today to talk about this is Rolf Hassenberg, a former air traffic controller and air traffic management consultant. Rolf, what's the current situation? It's pretty bad right now. Very basically, we can say that the system has been operating for a long time without enough air traffic controllers, and this situation will get worse as the industry continues to grow. Where is this problem particularly bad? There are chronic shortages in many parts of the world. In Australia, for example, staff shortfall has forced shutdown of services across many parts of the country, with many controllers working overtime to fill the gap. This has led to higher stress levels and controller fatigue, which has caused the relationship between the navigation service provider and the union to become quite tense over recent months. In Europe, there is an estimated shortage of a thousand controllers. In some European countries, the air traffic has more than doubled in the last five years, but the number of controllers has remained the same. This shortfall is projected to rise to 3,000 in the coming years. What about areas of the world that are developing quickly? Good question. Take India, where rapid expansion of the aviation infrastructure is causing staff problems. Delhi Airport, for example, currently has 200 controllers in total. The airport recently inaugurated its third runway and the internationally accepted number of controllers for an airport with three runways is 350. Why are there not enough controllers? Well, one of the problems is actually retaining staff. Air traffic and navigation services in South Africa, in spite of offers of higher wages and improvements in the working environment, is struggling to keep their controllers. A similar problem was faced by National Air Traffic Services in the UK, which was forced to completely rethink the way it managed its human resources. This had a very positive effect on controller morale. And what about recruitment? There is a general view among controllers that ANSPs, due to their different perceptions about staff numbers, are not doing enough to recruit enough trainee controllers to sustain current operations or address the shortfall. However, many regions of the world are planning big recruitment drives. The problem with recruitment is that many thinking of entering the ATC profession are being discouraged because of tough working conditions and the overtime. Another problem with training is that it takes a long time and has quite a high dropout rate. For example, in some training programs, up to 60% of trainees fail to complete the course and never actually become a qualified air traffic controller. And I understand retirement is also a problem. Is that right? Yes, many areas are facing problems with an aging controller population. Among the most troubled is the US, where close to half its 15,000 strong controller workforce is eligible to retire within the next 10 years. And what are the solutions to this? What is the industry going to do? Track 41. Delta 23 Golf Hotel, turn left heading 240 degrees, direct Roska. Climb flight level 130. Turn left heading 240 degrees, direct Roska. Climbing flight level 130. Delta 23 Golf Hotel. 
Estrella 525 Heavy. Climb flight level 170. Pass semi flight level 140 or higher. Climbing flight level 170 to be semi flight level 140 or higher. Estrella 525 Heavy. Okay, here 223000, evening. Yama 28, flight level 140, parallel 25. Previer 234, good evening. Descend and maintain flight level 100, squawk 3312. Descend and maintain flight level 100, squawk 2312, Previer 234. Rabbit Fower 87, climb flight level 170, reach semi flight level 140 or higher. Climbing flight level 170, reach semi flight level 140 or higher, Rabbit Fower 87. Kriever Approach, Delta Two Tree Golf Hotel, level at flight level 110. Request immediate descent. Delta Two Tree Golf Hotel, say reason for descent. We're picking up rye mice. We've got a nose down pitch due stuck elevator. Delta Two Tree Golf Hotel. Delta Two Tree Golf Hotel, Roger, descend flight level 70. Flight level 70, Delta Two Tree Golf Hotel. Diameter 1, flight level 140, Paral 38, Alpha 6, Tango Yankee Charlie. Alpha 6, Tango Yankee Charlie, descend and maintain flight level 120. Squawk 1, Fower 23. Descend and maintain flight level 120, Squawk 1, Fower 23, Alpha 6, Tango Yankee Charlie. Quiver approach, Rabbit Fower 87. We're experiencing severe chop due vortex from the heavy. Rabbit 487, vectors for avoidance. Turn left, heading 240 degrees. Turn left, heading 240 degrees. Rabbit Fower 87. Quiver Control, City Air 687, good evening. Passing altitude, Fower 1000 feet. City Air 687, good evening. Climb and maintain flight level 70. Squawk 225 Fower. Climbing flight level 70. Squawk 225 Fower. City Air 687. Midi, 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 Cuba Control, Alpha 6, Tango Yankee Charlie, Cessna Citation, 9 miles DME Northeast Paral, flight level 100, 2 crew, 2 passengers. The captain is not well at all with suspected stroke. Request immediate diversion to Tokran International. Alpha 6, Tango Yankee Charlie, Roger Mayday. Stand by. Previer 2 Tree Fower, aircraft behind you requires priority handling. Hold at Paro flight level 100. Expect onward clearance at time 39. Hold at Paro flight level 100, Previa 23000. Alpha 6 Tango Yankee Charlie, continue direct Paro. Cleared Paro 1 Alpha, arrival, talk around runway 3, far left. Descend and maintain altitude 6000 feet. QNH 1007. Continue direct Paro, cleared Paro 1 Alpha, arrival runway 3, far left. Descend and maintain altitude 6,000 feet, QNH 1007, Alpha 6 Tango Yankee Charlie. Charlie Mike Foxtrot 287, flight level 170. Charlie Mike Foxtrot 287, contact Porto Center 128 decimal 750. Contact 128 decimal 750. Goodbye, Charlie Mike Foxtrot 287. Delta 2 Tree Golf Hotel, 12 miles southeast Sami. Flight level 70. What is your situation now? We've regained full control of the aircraft. May we maintain this level? Delta 2 Tree Golf Hotel. Delta 2 Tree Golf Hotel, a firm. Continue direct Roska, flight level 70. Continue direct Roska, flight level 70. Delta 2 Tree Golf Hotel. Rabbit Fower 87. Turn right heading 300 degrees. Right heading 300 degrees. Rabbit Fower 87. Alpha 6 Tango Yankee Charlie. An ambulance will meet you on the south apron for a rapid transfer to hospital. Descend altitude 3,000 feet. Contact Tokaran Tower on 12 Fower Decimal Fower 50. Descend altitude 3,000 feet. Contact 12 Fower Decimal Fower 50. Thank you. Alpha 6 Tango Yankee Charlie. Previer 2 Tree Fower. Cleared Power 1 Alpha Arrival. Runway 3, far left. Descend and maintain altitude 6,000 feet. QNH 1007. Cleared power 1, Alpha arrival, runway 3, far left. Descend and maintain altitude 6,000 feet. QNH 1007. Previa 2, 3, far.
Cuiva approach. Estrella 525. Level at flight level 170. We have loss of cabin pressure, which we believe is from the right hand forward service door. Request lower. Estrella 525. Roger. Descend flight level 140. Descend flight level 140. Estrella 525. Track 42. Check your Aviation English by Henry Emery and Andy Roberts. Published by Macmillan Education, a division of Macmillan Publishers Limited. Copyright Macmillan Publishers Limited, 2010.